Mr. Nacella to begin his testimony. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. When uh, we last spoke, uh, last met, we were looking at two exterior uh, renderings that we had pre uh, prepared. Um, Perfect. So what you see here, this is going to be, I believe we're up to A8, I believe. So um, this is going to be the rendering key plan. So it's the aerial uh, site plan prepared by Bowman. Um, I've superimposed where the views that we're going to discuss momentarily where they originate. So here you can see exhibit A6, which is the view from the southeast. That was one of the ones we testified to last week. And as well from the northwest, exhibit A7, uh, that was the second rendering we did. Uh, during that meeting, there was a request by the board to see additional views. Those included two views from the Donahue Road, which is to the north of the project property, two views from the south, which is along U.S. Route 22 West, and then finally a view from the uh, Senior Housing Center next door, which is a view from the west. <clears throat> so again, this was... Elevate. This was uh, Exhibit A6. This is the view from the south southeast. So as you uh, just pass the entrance to the facility, this is from Route 22 looking up the berm towards the, the main building. You can see the monument entrance sign to the right, the landscaping which Mr. Winters testified to last week along the top of the berm which goes along Route 22 to screen the property from Route 22. Towards the right-hand side of the plan, this is the main entrance to the to the building. This is where you would first come as a first-time customer, where you'd sign your membership, you would um, make any arrangements for your contract, and get a tour of the facility to see the different size units that are available. Um, at the top of this parapet is the uh, Snapbox self-storage sign. Um, signage is located in, in two locations. One is on this east elevation, and one is on the south elevation, which we'll see from Route 22. Uh, the signs combined are less than 100 square feet. Um, with the board's approval, two signs would be allowed, and the, again, the signs meet the square footage requirements uh, for, the, for the town's ordinance. The signage is yellow in color. It's backlit internally, so there's no visible white light shining out of it, so at nighttime you'll just see a yellow glow. Um, it's not halo lit, it's not light shining from the ground or, or behind it, it's internally lit so it just glows up um, with the Snapbox self-storage sign. Uh, we mentioned last week the materials that were chosen, the upgraded materials, which is something you don't normally see on a <coughs> self-storage building, which is um, decorative brickwork, uh, EFIS panel, which is kind of a cement-like like or stone-like material. Um, and then punched windows to give it more of an office park feel. Again, those windows are not functioning windows. You would not be able to see into the building these, these punched windows here that you would see and along the bottom. <clears throat> you do see above the retail area, you will see into that clear story area, you'll see the second floor, you'll see uh, the blue doors of, of the units. That's fairly typical for what you would see in a self-storage design. It's um, kind of lets you know what the building is. It's part of the aesthetics, um, and basically every uh, branding has something similar to that. To the left here, where there's a canopy, that's another. That's one of our uh, loading areas. That's where customers they could park with, park their vehicles here. They can get carts from inside, go get boxes from their cars or, or trucks and bring them inside. This is also the area where there's a deeper parking spot. Um, provided that would be another um, enlarged loading area so a car doesn't take up the whole space. You still have ample room to kind of back in and you can unload your, your uh, car or van. All right, this would be exhibit A9, which is a view from the south. It's on the um, south side of the median of Route 22. So we're looking across Route 22, and this is the view you would see in that direction. So you can see the, the building is two stories here on the right. As you move to the left, maintains the height of two stories, and it does drop down. We talked about that kind of walkout basement um, at, that, at this corner of the building, which is necessitated by the slope of the property, the second uh, egress point from the property is down in that la layer. Um, so the building is a two-story building for the majority of the property. Um, one level is submerged as a basement level. As you can see, we continue 
the level of finishes and design elements of, of the east elevation across the south elevation as well with the brickwork, the EFIS work, um, the crown molding, cornice. Um, we've got the punched windows again that are not visible. We've got a two-story tower in, in this area here that has some of the visible self-storage units behind it. As you move further to the left, you can see this, the segmented section of the building. Um, in the plan, the building steps away from Route 22. It's kind of got a sawtooth shape. Um, one of the comments was from the board was to understand how the sawtooth looks. So this elevation definitely gives you more of a feel of how the building is stepped in different spots from Route 22. Um, as we move more towards the left, um, the building <coughs> starts to drop off due to the grade. We've, so we've got some increased brickwork, more glass, more windows. And then this area here is the basement entry point. There's a canopy um, that'll service the loading area that's um, down at this end of the building. Correct. So the <clears throat> just take a step back. So the this first one is is fully digitized. It was fully done on the computer. That was uh, A6. Um, so A9 A9 is a Google view. Um, I confirmed the date of the <coughs> excuse me that image. So the, any image from root marked A9 is that right? <coughs> Did we mark this before? As an A9. You went to A9. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just remember to speak into the microphone when you're speaking. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Route 22 images are Google Street Views. Um, they were done recently, but the photo date on the, on the Google Street View is actually July of 2018. Um, just so you know, I worked with uh, Paul Winters and his landscape group to delete any trees that have since either died or, or been removed from those views. So these represent um, the current view less those trees that were removed and anything that would be removed during the construction of this project. Um, the new landscaping is shown what's proposed. And again, the, we, you testified this last time, but the new landscaping that's proposed is at what age? Uh, it's roughly the five-year um, uh, growth period. Could you take us through which windows are real windows and which are sure. real windows? <clears throat> yep. Oh, sorry. So the square windows that you see here on the top and bottom of, of the first floor and the second floor, and then these windows here, anything that's a square kind of gridded window. So these four over here, these six, these, those are, are false windows. They're basically just frosted um, glass. They give the appearance of kind of being lit during the day. At night, they just, they're gone. You don't see them. There's no light emanating through them at all. Where the windows are real are these, uh, tower elements, if you will. So where the building kind of bumps out a little bit, we've got this brick pediment that comes up and over in this location, this location here. So that's true glass that you'd be able to see through and you see storage units um, behind it. So that's, that's where you can see those. Uh, it's more visible in this portion here where you can see the blue overhead doors. This guy? So, so this entrance here is a pair of is a pair of sliding doors. So once you're once you're a customer, that's where your access point would be. That's the only one. No, there's a, there's also one to the, I would, there's one to the right here. That's the office entrance. But they can't bring their stuff in. To they typically don't. They don't like to have I customers. Have So depending on on the vehicle that they would that would be bringing the furniture, um, like we said, if it's a if it's a smaller vehicle, there's parking up here and a and there's a little bigger spot for loading here, down at the south um, west corner of the building at the basement level, there is loading for larger vehicles. I think it was a 50, 55 foot truck. I think was the testimony was there's two loading spots. One where is the other one? It's down at the southwest corner of the building. I'll, you'll, you'll see, I, I can, let me go back to the overhead and you can see. So this area here where my hand is moving around, 
that's two larger loading uh, parking areas. So someone with a larger vehicle, a larger U-Haul could park the truck here, and then there's an access point at the basement level. The building is serviced by two elevators, so if their stuff is on the basement, they can come in at grade here. If it's on the second floor, they go in, go in the elevator, and up and over. Okay, so everything's there to accommodate. Yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. I have a question. See, uh, if you're looking from the south side at the existing building, uh, it's a little bit shorter, but you can still see uh, the existing building, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, for just that's a thank you for bringing that for as a, from, for a comparison. So, where my um, kind of hand is moving here. That's roughly the area of the existing building that you can see two stories above above the ground. The height of this building is is basically within a foot of the existing uh, two story office building, and it's actually set further back from Route 22 than the existing office building. It is longer across Route 22, but the in terms of height and proximity to 22 to start as closest point, it's almost in, in the same exact spot. The height of the existing building is comparable with the new building. Correct. Mm -hmm. In this rendering, where you, you could show us or point out to us where the loading dock is, and it is, is it obscured by the berm there that isn't drawn in front of it? Yeah, so I, the next view will show it a little clearer, but yes, down in, down in this area where, where my uh, cursor is moving, that's the area of the loading area, so the berm is actually higher um, than the road surface in that area, so it will be um, partially screened. I can move to the next one. To um, just Let me just go back one second. This is the second sign that I spoke about earlier on the Route 22 sign. Same composition um, and lighting package as the, the one on the east. This we'll call uh, Exhibit A10, which is a view from the southwest portion of uh, Route 22. Again, I'm standing south of the median on Route 22. Um, this was a Google uh, image. So here you can see the existing, I'm sorry, A10. A10, yes. This is A10, which is a southwest view. Um, these are the existing egre uh, ingress and egress points that are on the property now, and then it ties into our new internal roadway. So this area right here, is the, the two spaces that I'm provided for um, the larger loading. And then this door here, so a vehicle could in theory be parked roughly around here, and they would load into this covered opening on this basement level of the building. You can also see along the west um, property line, we've added shrubs and greenery along that property line to screen uh, the building. Uh, from the adjacent neighbor, and this patch of uh, green here, it's a little off-colored off green, not quite the same green as the grass and the berm. That was the, that's the fire lane, that's actually a grass fire lane that uh, Mr. Winters testified to uh, previously. And here's a good example of how you can see how the property does slope away. So here in this area, you're at the, t you're closer to two stories of the building exposed, and as you get closer to the southwest point of the, of the property, it drops down to the exposed three-story, um, which exposes the basement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exhibit A11, this would be a view from the west. Um, this is from the... Uh, the senior, cent the senior housing to the west of the, of the project site. This was a photograph that I took from the property, um, and this is looking directly at, the, at our facility. Now again, these trees, it's, it, was, it was a little premature, it's not spring, it wasn't fully spring yet, but this is the view that you would see from that parking lot. Um, so it is a, a fairly wooded area that in, in the summer, spring and summer and fall should be fairly uh, dense, and you can see our new landscaping dropped in the back as well, so the, the uh, coniferous trees uh, that have been added to the property. Um, the white band that you see through the, through the trees, that's the second floor of the building. The brick is the first floor of the building, 
and you can kind of see it's really difficult to even see where the basement level drops off down to the right. <clears throat> As we discussed uh, previously, this is uh, this was uh, exhibit a. Well, this was this was a set. This was existing A7, I believe. Um, so this is the view from just uh, coming on to Donahue um, from the cross street. Again, we discussed previously. You can the the dense growth in this corner screens the property really well. Um, making note, these two windows here are are, are one of those pair of fake uh, windows, is faux windows. So no light or no visibility will be coming through those windows. Are there any windows on the Donahue side that are going to cast light? Um, no, there, well, there, is an, there is a section where we're showing, um, there, you'll see on the render, you'll see the overhead doors. Um, the way where our layouts are actually working, those are gonna end up being <clears throat> frosted and you won't have anything that shines light. Just yes or no. So the answer is nothing on the Donahue side will cast light through windows. <clears throat> Excuse me, this, this elevation is a new exhibit, A12, which is a view from north taken from Donahue Avenue, Donahue Road, I mean, I'm sorry. You just said there would be no windows yet. Right, no, that's, why I'm ex that's why I couched it, because you were gonna, when I got to the slide, you're gonna see windows. Okay. So the way this is shown there, you can see through it, that's, that is incorrect. We've, because of the way the layouts work out, you're not gonna see that. You'll, they'll just be frosted glass panels. It'll look like glass, but again, no light coming through, no visibility of the- Would you the, be willing to stipulate then, just to, so we don't have any confusion? Absolutely, yes, so yeah, no, yes, no the overhead- Windows that aren't frosted, or whatever, however you wanna call it in architectural language? Correct, the, I can say the, the elevation facing Donahue Road, um, which is the north elevation, will not have any true windows that allow visibility into the facility or light to come out of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this was, again, a Google Street View. Um, the Donahue Roadside, those images, um, as I said, were July 2018. Um, some trees had been removed that have, have previously died since that photo was taken, but what you see here are, are new trees that are being planted as part of the landscaping plan. So again, with the, the grade um, and the, the dense plantings that are being proposed, we tried to mask uh, the facade from Donahue Road as much as possible. <clears throat> and finally, uh, A13. Uh, this is a view from the northeast. Uh, again, Google Street View from Donahue. Um, Plantings all in here are all the new plantings. There's a new tree. Um, and then, so this is the kind of, we took this view from an angle rather than straight on because you would see this driving up down here as you kind of look to the left out your window, you would kind of see this diagonal view through the open patch. Um, so it gives a nice three quarter view of the existing building. This is the entrance area we talked about previously with the signage um, and the, the uh, and, excuse me, customer entrance here. Um, and again, similar to the previous view, this view with the glass, we are stipulating that there will, you will not see into the building or have light cast out. You can see a small portion of punch windows as well, just to give it that office uh, character. Um, the intent, hopefully, by seeing these images, that um, the building, although larger in scale than the office building, it is um, in height, very similar. Um, the use of materials, I think, brings a nice uh, office park feeling to it, and it's not uh, <clears throat> overpowering on the surroundings. The windows that are facing, I guess if you're looking on, you're traveling on 22 heading west, and you're looking at those windows, they will um, cast light um, during the evening hours until the close of business. Those, two, no, not the fake ones. No, you're okay with the the view we're looking at. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's the, so looking, right, so looking west, so it's the eastern facade of the building, yes. Right. So these, the windows up high here. No, not those. No light. These windows here, you will, you will see, and that's the, you know, it's, it's on the west side. It's not facing Route 22. It's not facing the neighbors. So we felt as the front entrance of a, of a building that that was inappropriate. And then the ones right around the corner from that, you said, won't be casting any light. 
the ones that are facing Land Donahue. Right. Yeah, image right facing yep. Donahue, those will not be, yes, correct. Okay. The, the elevation on Donahue. The elevation on Donahue, correct. Great, thank you. Yeah, so these will, be, these will be frosted right here. Um, we did go, we did touch on the floor plans, but we kind of jumped into renderings last week. Um, if you want me to pull up the floor plans again, if you guys have questions that you want me to go into further detail, I'd be happy to do that, um, or I can answer any questions on the the renderings. This is your case. Okay. No, I, I did I last week we started it, and I know we kind of got pushed into the rendering, so I can I can bring them up and just do a quick I, quick. I would ask you to do that. Sure. Can I ask some questions on the renderings uh, before we go to that point? Yeah. Um, did the renderings um, consider the uh, HVAC rooftop units? So the renderings don't show them. Um, I'll have a roof plan that I, that I can show you, but basically what we do is the rooftop units are, are fairly small for uh, building size, but we locate them into the center of the property, into the center of the building. So your viewpoint angles, your viewing angles, like from Route 22, um, you'd have to be like six, 700 feet away before you start to see the top of them. Um, because of the angle, you know, the, the, uh, <clears throat> your viewing angle. Um, but we do are uh, proposing a roof screen around, around them so you don't see the units themselves. There'll be a, there'll be a metal roof screen. Hmm. That way, if, if it is ever seen, you're not looking at air conditioning ducts, you're looking at a nice finished louver panel. We kind of paint them go away beige or go away gray, and that way they kind of disappear into a cloudy day too. How tall are the rooftop units? <clears throat> So the, so the top of the um, rooftop unit from the roof line. Uh, they're typically about six and a half feet high. They're currently six and a half feet high, off the roof line. So we typically okay, so that's put inclusive of like any dunnage that they're supported off of. Six and correct. A half yeah. Feet. Okay. Yeah, it's mounted. Usually, it's like on an eight-inch curb, and then we put the uh, roof screen um, a little higher than that, so it screens it from any angle. Okay. Uh, Ms. Simmons had a question about the um, relative elevations of the the existing building versus proposed building. Um, do you ha have the true elevation of what the existing is and what the proposed will be? So going from a set of drawings that's very, very old. It looks like the top parapet of the um, existing building. So I'm gonna give a number, it's 157.75. That's basically like an above sea level number, mm -hmm. right? So the new building, our parapet's at 158 feet. So it's about a six, six inch difference in height. And, and same parapet height for both buildings? That's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's measured to the parapet. I took worst case height of the building, even though it's not measured to the parapet. I, that's the highest portion that you see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So these were the plans that were submitted, so they're not exhibits, they're just plans that were um, submitted as part of the application. Uh, Top plan is the first floor plan. Second floor, second floor, second floor, excuse me, is the, this is the seller plan on the, on the lower level here. So coming in on our parking lot, this is the main retail entrance. This is the customer entrance once they're uh, rented units. So again, first time you come into this small office area, get a tour of the facility, negotiate your contract, figure out what size units you need. Um, this is where all the basic office functions occur. There's a um, break room, building security, toilet rooms. Um, and then behind that is the utility rooms in terms of where the gas, water, and electric comes into the building. We have uh, two elevators located in the building, one here and then one here. We have two egress stairs, one here and one here. Uh, elevators and egress stairs serve all three floors. 
Uh, the elevators are set at a certain distance kind of based on uh, industry standards, so you're never really too far from an elevator from your cube or for your entrance. Um, so again, as mentioned before, at the, if you had a larger delivery of furniture um, down in the southwest corner, this is where you would come in. Uh, you, the larger U-Hauls could be here. You go into the facility, go to your elevator, up to the first floor, up to the second floor, or you stay on this floor if this is where your um, unit happens to be. The way we design this is we try and keep the larger units tend to be on the lower floors because you've got more stuff. You want to limit the number of uh, trips up and down the elevator. So your larger units tend to be serviced from at grade. So as you can see here, uh, uh, the Ds and, and Es are some of the larger units. Um, so they're located off this main entrance here at the lower level. Then when you get up onto the main level, which is first floor, so if you're coming in from the east, uh, again, some of the larger units are closest to the entrances. And then when you get up to the second floor, the units tend to be smaller. So they look at a lot of um, five by tens, five by fives, ten by tens, smaller items, uh, smaller storage units that are easily uh, accessed from the elevators. I did want to just touch on, so you can see here in this upper, upper right corner, you can see the glass and the storage units immediately behind it serviced by an aisle. So this is the area where I'd said you would not see into the building. So this glass is basically just spandrel. It's a, it's a false glass. Um, the front facing the, uh, the main entrance to the building, so looking to the east, you have an aisle, and that's where you have true glass. But again, all along the Donahue Roadside, units are right up against the building. So even though we're showing windows, you're not seeing into the building at all. It's all false. And then this to, to touch on the rooftop units. So we're proposing right now three rooftop units um, located in the center of the building. And then we have a roof screen around them to help with any screening. I think that's about it. Mr. Marsala, thank you for the additional photo simulations. You're welcome. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, th I, th I think they do do, a, uh, do justice to the building and help explain views from all sides. So I think they're definitely beneficial. I have a question regarding the interior layout. Mm -hmm. The wall that is separating each unit, is it like a solid wall or is it a wire mesh? What, what is good? Oh, what's it constructed of? So it's basically... Um, it kind of looks like a really nice corrugated metal panel. It's basically a, a rectangular ribbed panel. So all the units are built out of these metal, white metal um, walls. They go eight feet high. Um, and then above the eight feet, it's open, so you allow air conditioning and, and sprinklers and lights to kind of flow over the whole space. There is isn't a security mesh that goes in at the eight foot level. So that stops anyone from stacking something too close to the sprinklers, higher than they need to be. Also stops from, from going into their unit and hopping over into the one next door. How difficult is it to deconstruct that? So if someone walked in and bought the whole top floor, you could pull out all the corrugated steel mesh that's separating these units. There's a bunch of nuts and they just come out and... It's a, it's a kind of like an erector set kit of parts. It can, um, it can be uh, revised. Um, I kind of know where you're... Thinking, I think, is um, the concern of making units that are too big and becoming something more, right? Um, so the way these are constructed is there's a column every 10 feet um, that keeps um, steel, the amount of steel that goes into the building um, very low, but it and it allows you that modular activity, but it really prevents you from getting any usable space more than like that 10 by 10 or 10 by 20 module. Once you start going bigger, you've got columns that just make the space not, not really worth one. use this opportunity to, again, Mr. Wang hit on it and did a great job that, you know, there's going to be no forklifts. That was a stipulation, but there's no warehousing. Uh, right. The township council passed an ordinance, you know, strictly there's no usage in any, any area of the floor that is for warehousing. Um, as great as the design <coughs> is, I just don't want money to prevail and someone coming in and buying the entire floor of a, a widget maker and, you know, conceivably, if it's not hard to, to pull these walls apart, 
that Mrs. Amin asked about, you know, I would be concerned, but it sounds like there's a stipulation for no forklifts and that this construction is quasi-permanent and it would be difficult for someone to go and take up a, a large space and it also doesn't sound like it's in your business model to have that as well, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. In addition, I, I had the opportunity to speak with Mr. Aller uh, <coughs> at the last hearing and we threw out some additional conditions that we would be willing to accept uh, upon your approval, which would include a condition against employees working in any of the units themselves, as well as a condition specifically prohibiting any distribution uh, out of those facilities. Perfect. Thank you. So I have another question. Let's say someone uh, wants two units side by side. They can uh, move and make it bigger in space, like the, the E unit, the biggest one they want, two of those side by side. So they, so the units come in a, in a variety of sizes. They go anywhere from five by five up in this space up to 10 by 20. Um, so there's lots of variations. So ideally they would um, purchase a unit or rent a unit that's sized accordingly um, or two next to each other. Operationally, I would have to defer and see if, if, if there's a history of opening them up to allowing them to do that or they just rent adjacent units. I don't know the answer. Try and get our microphone if you can there somehow. Just for the new members, you're CEO of yeah, uh, Matthew Lang, um, COO of Snapbox Self Storage. We're based in Philadelphia. Uh, we own or manage about three and a half million square feet of self storage across 10 states. Um, so, uh, the specific question if somebody rented multiple units, uh, in our lease agreement, they are unable to make alterations to the space. So uh, typically what happens when somebody has a requirement for more space is that they're renting multiple units, but they're unable to modify the physical condition. Um, the, the modular construction of storage units does allow for us as we're going through lease up, you know, we put a unit mix plan together for what we expect the market to need. Um, over time, those needs do change. And so, uh, for instance, on the second floor where we have a lot of the smaller units, um, there are occasions where we'll take out a partition wall on the five by 10 size units to make more medium size units. But these are not intended to create uh, 1,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet or anything from a distribution or warehousing perspective, um, just to maximize uh, occupancy and efficiency. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Any other board members, questions? Yeah, you good? I'm good. I don't know if we're professionals, architecture. All right, I have uh, two, two oh, questions. Please, Mr. Vesio. Uh, one question. Um, what is the floor for the, the three levels of, lo of uh, storage? What is the floor uh, design load for that? So uh, uh, light storage, which this falls under, so self-storage is considered a S1 use, and it's 125 pounds per square foot. Okay. It's a load. I understand we're not going to have any sort of hazardous materials stored within this facility. Correct. Uh, you know the hazardous classification for what you're designing to? Well, or it's, storage uh, classification? It's, it's S1, S1, which yeah. is, which is uh, the kind of the all-encompassing. So it's this stricter design standards for an S1 versus S2. So S1 is, allows to have, uh, have items stored that are for type S1 or S2, but hazardous. Sure. But no H, no H. No H okay. in here, no. And then my last question is, um, you had mentioned maybe two meetings ago, the, the, so the shape of the lot was sort of driving some inefficiencies with the architectural layout. Um, I think you're, right now your, your usable space, I think for your drawings here is about 72%. I mean, what, I mean, how much better could you do if this was, you know, a perfect, you know, rectangular building or a rectangular site? Or, or maybe if you want, you know, if you could maybe reassess that statement, um, is, is, is the shape of the lot driving a um, underutilized building? So, so typically, um, you know, obviously a, a rectangle is going to be your most, a perfect rectangle is going to be your most efficient um, use of space, and typically that'll get you like around 75% efficiency. Um, so again, the shape of this lot has kind of, in order to um, maximize our area, we've come up with this segmented um, sawtooth shape 
it does make it less um, efficient. So we don't get as true, we, we don't hit that 75% number. Um, whereas the previous building we had here was kind of that trapezoid shape. That was not really good either because you get all sorts of weird shapes and things. So the efficiency is not good on that. But this shape improves on that efficiency. A rectangle would be, you know, would be would be more efficient, um, but there are cases where we found that sometimes a rectangle you can't get that perfect number because mm -hmm. of just the size of it. So by the time you start lining up the size units you want to have, you end up with a building maybe like five feet short or ten feet shorter than it wants to be. Sometimes it's funny that extra five feet across a hundred foot building brings the efficiency significantly up. Um, and the current utilization is 72.4 percent. Is that accurate? It is 72.4 percent. Correct. Okay, so it's it just slightly less than what your optimal scenario. Yeah, about, yeah, about two and a half percent. So two and a half on. I'm just saying. So on 100,000 is two and a half thousand square feet. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I have one quick question. Are are there doors on the back? Uh, in back meaning um, where the fire. Path is. Are there doors on the back of the building? On, on the Donahue side, on the north side, yes. Yeah, let me come back. All right, that's fine. Yeah, so you can see on the... Right. So if, in the, if there's a fire, obviously, they can gain access there, considering that's the fire lane. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so the fire lane's right there. So again, so basement level, you're going to go up a flight and out. Second floor, you're going to go down a flight and out. First floor, you're at, at grade. So it's stairs serving all three levels. And yes, they do dump mm. back towards the fire lane on Donahue. All right, board professionals, good evening. Who wants first crack? Thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate the uh, updates to the building. I think they were helpful. Um, uh, but I do think that there are t a few questions I had raised in my review memo dated March 21st um, that I don't think were answered yet. Uh, regarding the north elevation off on the Donahue Road elevation, uh, do you have the um, dimension for the length of the entire building? It's 324 feet in length. Okay, thank you. And do you know there's there's kind of a um, what I'd characterize as a kind of a blank portion of the wall in the middle there. Do you have the length of, of that portion, basically from the last faux window on the left to the architectural treatment on the right, and pretty much from 20, number 24 to marker number 10 or so? So basically on, on the north facade, um, so basically from 11, which is, so 7 to 11 is one of those uh, brick and glass towers. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 and 30, 33 is one of those as well. So basically from 10 to 30, so you have a, it's about 180 feet where there's nothing. Um, okay. It's just a stucco um, and the brick treatment below. We did not... Um, we didn't put any windows along that facade. We just tried to minimize the impact on Donahue. Um, so we just kind of had glass as you kind of turn the corners, uh, as you turn the northeast corner, as you turn the, the southwest corner, uh, sorry, north, northwest corner. That's where we kind of focused our, our glass treatment. Um, I'll pull up that, out, that rendering so you can see. Those, those, just to clarify, those glass windows that face Donahue don't project any light. Correct. They're just they're just fake, right? Fake windows. Okay. Right. So so this is actually this is probably a good uh, view f to express your uh, question. Yeah. So here's here's the the tower at the at the uh, eastern side, and then there's one down here. So there is a blank facade. This is where that around 180 feet or so of blank wall is. Again, we buffered it pretty substantially with with trees, so we didn't feel um, it was doing anything real by putting fake windows in along there. Uh, my comment held before I saw the elevation, the, the exhibits presented, and I, I, I still believe 
um, that something should be added to that portion of the building simply because the view is impacting the residential neighbors and it it does have like a, a warehouse feel to that portion of the building because it's blank so especially because the second floor is visible and might be visible and you know seasonally I, I think that maybe some additional treatment on that portion especially something like a faux window that doesn't have that much impact maybe space the existing windows that you proposed a little further apart um, and and add them along the length there to just to break up the mass and of that building right yeah so I um I, if the if that's something the board would like us to um, consider or pursue, we could definitely add additional faux windows along that second height, similar to what we have on the front elevation. I think that'd be helpful. Any number of windows? How many you think in there? No, I, like I said, you could you could right now their spacing is pretty close together. Um, they did it kind of in little small sections, and rather than that, I think just spacing them apart so that there isn't this blank stucco elevation that the neighbors can see that does give. Um, a colder feel than even the office building that was there right. with glass windows and around all the sides. So um, something that feels a little bit closer to residential and less like a warehouse. Is that something you're able to do? Yeah. Great. And what we'll do is I guess we'll make it subject to the planners review if, if they like the way it looks when we submit into it. That would be fine. Um, I, I, and this is just a suggestion upon you know seeing some of the elevations. I do think there's a bit of a missed opportunity with um, that corner feature um, that shows the doors inside where the offices are located. Oh. Uh, and when you noted, when, when you responded to the chairman's question about um, those windows being frosted on that corner, yeah. Um, so that looks really nice. Um, but then the windows basically on the right there that are facing Donahue are not going to match the side that this is more towards 22, right? It's not, it's not all going to be see-through glass. Right, this, this would not be see-through. Yeah. So, so again, so we, were, we wanted to show some consideration to the neighbors where, one, they may not want to see. You know, so, so what we do, just to kind of clean up how this wor works, is this is actually in a, a hallway here, so there will be lights on. So at night, you'll be able to see in there, and you'll see that hallway lit up. You'll see the blue doors. Um, so we didn't necessarily want to have that facing Donahue. And I um, don't disagree with that. I just mean the corner feature, I think, could have been flipped to the 22 side. So that, and this, this is just a suggestion. This is something just that, that I noticed that that same feature could be a full corner at the 22 side with the windows fully transparent. Right, so kind of, so actually we did before the building started getting sawtooth, we did have something similar to that. Okay. But we felt that this one, because it's kind of pushed further back, we started to introduce that element more along the facade of, of Route 22. So we have it here. It's not a corner, but it's, it's a facade treatment. Um, yeah, it's the entryway. So I thought, it, you know, it does have some prominence there. And that corner, I, I thought it looked nice on the rendering, you know, except for the consideration to the neighbors that it had to be frosted. So uh, I, it, just to give it some thought, if you wanted to, okay. um, you know, the potentially flipping it to the other side towards 22, I think it could be a really nice feature. Uh, I know you did add other ones along the 22 exposure, um, so you don't want to make it too repetitive and you don't want to make it too cluttered on that side, but mm -hmm. I, I think as a corner feature it could, you know. Um, right, so you're, you're suggesting, so in essence, that retail corner flipped to the mm -hmm. 22 side. Exactly. Just a suggestion. So we could we could we could look at that. I would have to look at it from a site plan too to see how if it how it absolutely how loading areas and cir site circulation works if we were to were to change that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that's all I have for the architect though right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple, Mr. Chairman. Sure. This is a good a good exhibit. I want to ask you a question about Mr. Nacella. Um, I see the monument sign for Snapbox. That's near the easterly entrance, correct? Yes. And that's a representative view of what's proposed. Mm -hmm. And that's compliant with our ordinance currently in terms of the size, correct? Right. I believe we did make that. This, um, Mr. Winters made it that size, yeah. You're also proposing facade signage as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. Up here, Are you can see Do any of your renderings show or is it just difficult to see from here? Do they show the facade signage? Yeah, so, so here on the, on the upper right, kind of where my mouse is, it says Snapbox Storage. Okay. 
That's so it's just, it, it's just going to be the text. Yeah, it's just text. There's no yeah, no logo, and it's just it's just Got the font it. snap box, and it's one on the on the Route 22 side as well. Same same size on the Route 22 side. Same signage, yeah, different size, but same signage. Yeah. So you're going to have facade on the east side. You're going to have facade signage on the Route 22 sign. Correct. They as well meet the ordinance requirements in terms of the size. Correct. Yeah. The, yeah. The, well, it all comes in in terms of height off the ground, and, and the total signage is less than 100 square feet. I think the only, if, not to want to speak out of turn, but I think the, the question is the two signs, I think, has to be approved. The two facade signs would have to be approved right. by the town. Right. But it's not necessarily relief from what's allowed. It's just with consent by the board. Correct. Yeah. I believe that's the way it's right. Okay. Um, can you go to exhibit, I think it was A12 or A13, and it was, it was again, the view from Donahue, one of the two. That's, that's fine. Okay. So one of the board members asked a question about the rooftop equipment, and you explained that that was going to be screened, and it was going to be, the equipment was going to be positioned near the center of the roof, and that there was going to be a screen around the equipment. Correct. Will that screen or that, that fence extend to the top of the equipment? Yes, yeah, so it goes to the top of the rooftop unit. So, so, in, so in theory, this, this view, you wouldn't see it because it's so far in. Um, higher elevations or further distances away, you would start to, you would start to see those. But yes, the, the screening is the same height of the, the rooftop equipment itself. OK. And that, that was really what I wanted to emphasize, because on the Donahue side, as the elevation rises on Donahue, you get closer to the top of the building. I wanted to make sure, even though it was at the center, that right. there wasn't going to be visible or they wouldn't see the actual equipment. Right, the equipment will have completely screened. So I, and to, to be honest, I believe you, if you go up um, that street, I can't think of the name of this, that cross street. So the existing office building has rooftop units on it. This building's basically the same height. They're not screened, though, but you can, as you get up higher in elevation, you'll start to see those rooftop units. That's why we've chosen to screen them so you're not looking at the... Okay. If you did, you wouldn't look at the unit itself. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Uh, members of the public, any questions on architectural testimony? <coughs> Ms. Westlake, right? Yes. Good Thank you. Good evening. Rosalind Westlake here on behalf of Arthur's Self Storage. Uh, just a couple um, informational questions. Um, the real windows are located on the um, where you walk in for the office, and then there's two two of those towers on the front on 22. Is that correct? Correct. On Route 22, there's two um, brick and glass towers. And those are the those are real glass. Correct. Okay. And so, does light emanate from all three of those sections? Light is not. It's no different than a light being on inside an office building in your house. It's not. Right. None of the sign. None of the lights are directed outward, but you look and you will see light inside the it'll building. be it'll be lit and then um what are the hours that those lights are lit um, i think we can stipulate to like i guess when the main signs the main lights on the property go off well there's been previous testimony about the hours in which customers are able to access mm -hmm. obviously during those hours sure sure no i just was trying to get a sense of whether there would be some lighting within the building 24 7 or or what have you i mean and, and i would appreciate why you would do that i just trying to understand that's all. emergency lights of any kind 24 7. yeah there's emergency lighting and all it's mm -hmm. all on uh right. light uh, excuse me motion sensors inside so if it, but this but there is dedicated fixtures that are battery backup and emergency right backup. right Perfect. Okay, that make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then the you said that the the fascia signs are um, inter internally lit. Correct. Are they internally lit twenty four seven? I don't think we talked about the uh, length of time that signs would be on um, as part of our testimony. We we haven't testified to anything at, at this time. Okay. Um, but again, it's okay. I was just curious. Um, and then finally. Um, there had been testimony that there's no trash enclosure, and so that the trash would be somewhere inside the building. Can you tell me where that might be? 
Right, so typically what happens is when there's no dumpster or trash enclosure on site, the, the, the management will schedule pickups for the trash to be picked up. What they typically do is take one of the smaller units and use that as kind of like a, a storage um, for, for the general office trash that they, that they occur. There's no cardboard boxes or anything like that or bubble wrap doesn't get stored. It's um, typical office use garbage. So, so a customer's trash, you know, take, if they, they have... They, can't, they have to take their, their garbage with them. They can't leave boxes anywhere. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public, questions on the architecture testimony? <clears throat> Just your name and address, uh, please. You, you made use of the... I'm Ron Kersey. Na name and address? Please. Name and address? Sure. Ron Kurzea, K U R Z E J A, 32 Shady Lane, Boundbrook. Ready when you are. Sa you satisfied? Are you satisfied, Mr. Ellis? Yeah, you gave us a Bridgewater address, I think, last well, time. Well, it is Bridgewater. It happens to use the Boundbrook Post Office. I thought you knew that from the last time. Just for the record. So. That's fine. Good evening, sir. How are you? You made use of the term efficiency of the building or something like that during, during your testimony. Do you mm -hmm. recall the, the term I do. efficiency? Mm -hmm. What did that mean? What is that term? So that's the proportion of the building. So I'll talk in general terms. So if a building's 100,000 square feet, a building that's 75% efficient means that 75% of it is actually used as rentable area for the project. So, so out of a 100,000 square foot building, a building that's 75% efficient, they can rent 75,000 square feet worth of um, storage area. So the non-efficient space is the hallways? And hallways, retail space, uh, elevator shafts, mechanical shafts, you know, stair towers, et cetera. Um, the rooftop units, are they part of the height calculation? For uh, the rooftop units are not, are not part of the calculation for building height. The zoning ordinance permits that to be excluded? Correct, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, I heard the gentleman from Snapbox make reference to rental agreements and what's permitted and what's not permitted. My, my perception is that there's a high level of opacity in this application. Is there any reason, I'm addressing this gentleman, is there any reason why no Snapbox model documents have been provided as part of this application? A lot of the agreements um, uh, to a degree are um, within New Jersey lien law. Uh, agreements within the state are modeled off of that requirement. <coughs> Other than that, um, there are standard form agreements that uh, the association can provide and that uh, from time to time we have to make modifications due to uh, the way we operate the business. What association are you making reference to? Self Storage Association. It's an organization of I guess, owners or companies like your own? Correct. That are, okay. Um, would it be fair to make a request of you to produce the agreement that you use and you would contemplate using in this particular location? You know, Steve, we don't really need to see those documents. The board, this board has no jurisdiction over their internal lease document. The only thing we would do is potentially ask them to put in certain conditions if the board felt that certain language needed to be in the um, in the document. But their business lease, we don't have any jurisdiction over and we don't need to see. And the Let testimony me ask you. that's been provided tonight and it was also when Mr. Lang originally testified in relation to the document as mm -hmm. well, that if this board were to so approve this application, we would consent to the conditions on the items such as no hazardous materials and other things that were relevant mm -hmm. and discussed. I heard your testimony make reference to the length of the building. Um, I've not been able to independently verify that, but I, you said something about the length of the building. I think 
That would have been on the Donahue side of about 300 feet. Uh, three, excuse me, 324 feet is the length on the Donahue side. Okay. What, what is the length of the existing building on the Donahue side? I, I don't have that information in front of me, but I know it, it is, it's a smaller footprint. Any idea to estimate? I, I, is it under 100, maybe? No, I don't believe it's that small. Okay. Have you done any work, any additional, I guess, workups on other buildings that would f better fit the footprint, the usable footprint of this particular lot for this purpose? Have I, in terms of self-storage or in terms of any building type, what do you? In terms of self-storage, that's the application we're here for. Correct, yes, this is, I believe, our third iteration of, of designs to try and work with the board to uh, come to a amenable. Have other, other, other iterations that you may not have brought further or that you've not, you've decided to abandon? We do numerous schemes and discuss them internally to find. The answer. Say that again. We do schemes internally to find the best uh, option to present to the board. You said the best options was that to maximize the number of units on this. A, a combination of maximizing uh, units for the for the owner, in terms of uh, allowing for the property to have a good amount of uh, pervious coverage and try and meet the setbacks and, and regulations to the best of our ability. So it's a it's it's a it's a mix. There's no there's no a to a to z. Uh, path for that. It's a it's a constantly moving pieces, looking at different options and and weighing the the balance, the cost of asking for variances versus satisfying code and and getting a building that that's good for the owner. I didn't hear you make mention of a particular criteria that is maximizing maximizing profit. Do you believe that what you've done in I've, effect? It's a high weight on maximizing profit in this location? My job is, as the architect is to, to maximize the, the building that'll, that'll get approved by the town and, and work for my client. I don't, I'm not involved in the, the economics of, of, of his business. Did any, anybody on the team, was anybody on the team responsible for maximizing the profitability of this location? I, th I believe that was addressed in prior testimony. There was um, analysis done on the property. Not by me. Not, I'm not an expert in that, category, that field, so. In connection with the fact that this application is seeking a use variance, there was testimony provided with respect to market conditions uh, and the viability for this site from an economic point of view previously given this witness is an architect and can't obviously. I, I, and I was going to say, he hasn't testified to that, so this is just cross of his testimony, not other. Sir, I have in front of me a do, um, an attachment to a document that was submitted, that was part of a, of a workup on March 21, 2024. It's identified as Table 1, and it makes reference to the zoning, or, the zoning ordinance that identifies a C5 zone. Are you familiar with that document? I'm not even familiar. What, 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 which document is it? This was a document that was part of a letter to Nancy Probst from, let me just find it. I think you're referring to the planners. Yeah, I'll show it to you. Catherine Sampai. Okay, hi. You want to see? I'm familiar with it. Yep. Is that the planners report? That is, Rich. From March 21st? I could check it again. Give me one second. You, you might know better than I. I'm looking for the first page. I, it was March. I didn't think it was the 21st. For some reason, I thought the 24th, but I, I stand corrected. Uh, I'm sorry. It is March 21st. Okay. Sir, a couple of things that stand out it is the minimum front yard setback from Route 22. The requirement is 200 feet. Okay, and you're proposing, I believe, with this particular version of the project, 54.1 feet, which is in round numbers about 25% of what's required. Okay. 
Do, do you think that you can substantially increase the setback and still have a workable project? This witness has not testified as to the viability of the project or Right. That, that would be an appropriate question for the planner and if the engineer comes back up for anything, but not this witness. Okay. Let me just check one second. No further questions right now. All right, other members of the public, questions? All right, seeing none, your next witness. Thank you. I'm going to recall, and thank you, thank Mr. Masella. I'm going to recall Mr. Winters for some engineering cleanup. Mr. Winters, you understand you're under oath. I guess I'll begin by saying, I guess there was uh, the last hearing in which there was uh, testimony provided by you, um, Mr. Burr, and you had had some conversations. Maybe I'll, I'll, I don't know, Mr. Burr, if you want to actually address the board first. But. Diana? Why, why don't you set us up? Sure. Just give us some testimony and Mr. Burr can respond to it. Uh, I'll just turn it over to Mr. Winters with respect to uh, comments. Uh, sure thing. Good, good evening, uh, Chair, members of the board. Good to see everybody tonight. Um, I had some uh, discussion with uh, Mr. Burr following uh, the past hearing, and um, it was uh, regarding his, his request. He, he asked us to take another look through at one of the uh, zoning standards, in specific, uh, one uh, particular to uh, a calculation stipulated under the Hillside Development section of the Zoning Code, that's of Chapter 126 of the Land Use Code. Um, just, just to ensure that our, our calculations were consistent with that, and we, we happily looked at that just to uh, confirm we are consistent with that. Um, with that, we actually did discover that there is a difference in calculation method that does apply to that, and we just wanted to ensure that we're representing properly to the board uh, what that calculation needs to be to, to ensure that complies. And this is only relevant, again, to one of the uh, parameters that the hillside development section applies to, and that's the floor area ratio calculation. Um, the, generally what the hillside development section of the code does in a few instances, it, uh, it requires a reduced, either a reduced standard of the bulk standards to be in effect based upon how much steep slopes are on a portion of the site, uh, or it applies to uh, a reduction in the me means of calculation of uh, what the, the value is for your site. Um, we, we had performed the initial calculation and applied a reduction, and, and we, we evaluated this with our steep slope analysis that was submitted, and those, those steep slope areas are unchanged. Uh, so the basis for it is unchanged, but when we had presented the prior calculation for floor area ratio, we had identified it as a reduction towards the requirement in the zone as opposed to applying it to the standard. And I'll, I'll give you the specific numbers in a minute. Uh, what this does is it means I'm about to describe different floor area ratio for our property than what I previously put in testimony. Uh, I just want to be clear with this, though. This is no change at all in the building as presented. The floor area of the building is as previously testified to. It's just, it, it's, it's a correction of the math to ensure we're consistent with the ordinance. I, I just want to be clear on that for the board's benefit. Um, so with that, uh, in the C5 zone, the requirement uh, uh, for maximum floor area ratio is 0 0.25, and that does not change under the Hillside Development Ordinance. That was, that was the part we're correcting here. We had reduced that in our prior zoning analysis, and that remains the 0.25. That's our requirement that we're going to be seeking variance relief from. Um, as submitted with our steep slope calculations, we determined the, uh, what, what the steep slope, excuse me, the hillside development, I'm calling it by the informal name, what the hillside development ordinance stipulates is for varying categories of slope, a reduction factor applies on what part of the lot you effectively can build on. And what that does is you end up calculating a reduced 
lot area. You're not actually reducing the lot area in this case, but it's for the sake of the calculation. When we calculate the floor area ratio, real simply, it's the total gross building area divided by the total lot area. The uh, ordinance section in this case directs us to take the reduced lot area based upon the weighting, the, the reduction factors for the steep slope areas. The number for that would reduce the, the denominator in this equation, what we're dividing the building floor from the total lot area of 149,902 square feet down to, uh, we calculated 114,846 square feet. So if you can do the math in your head a little, you could see where I'm going with this. Our floor area ratio is going to sound like it's going up. It's like I said, though, the same square footage of building we had before. As we previously presented, we uh, calculated our floor area ratio of 0.693, and that's based on the total lot area. When we update the calculation for the, um, make sure I use the right term, the reduced area, the total land available is the term right out of the ordinance. That 114,000 square feet, instead of a 0.693 floor area ratio, we calculate that as a 0.905 floor area ratio. Um, there's a couple of things I want to just mention to put that into perspective on the application because, yes, it sounds like that's a jump in number, and really it's just a means of the mathematics catching up to, to represent what's in the ordinance here. Um, in, in general, the hillside development chapter intends to address uh, development on previously undeveloped land. That's the primary concern to ensure that those areas are being developed uh, properly, responsibly. Uh, Yet in our case here, we have a previously developed property. Um, all of the slopes that were accounted for when we did our steep slope calculation, they were all previously developed or, or man-made, if you will, um, as opposed to undeveloped existing steep slopes or cuts or ridges or things like that. It was, it was all um, man-made development. Um, and with that in mind, the other thing I also want to mention with, with the calculation, to put it in context, the, uh, as I said, the building floor area is the same as we presented, which was still a 20% reduction in the original application's floor area. Um, just, just for comparison, I want to extend the, the proper calculation to the original application. When we submitted the original application, um, that total floor area would have resulted in us seeking a 1.31 floor area ratio of 1.131, which with the reduced building floor area is only a 0.905 floor area ratio. So that's, that's I just want to put that up for comparison. And yes, that's 20% reduction from the original. Um, so I, I thank the board for their attention to the mathematics of that. Just as I said, we want to ensure we're consistent with the ordinance and just wanted to clear up any confusion that might have emanated from that. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or if, if Mr. Burr has anything further he wants to uh, clarify with, with our what, intent. What percent of this building is impacted by our steep slopes ordinance? I, I have that one moment, please. Um, And Bill, if you know the answer, you're, you'll get credit. It looks like around 15,000 square feet of surface area. Yeah. Of, so if you, if, if, you, if you take a look at the steep slope exhibit or plan that Mr. Winters prepared after the first hearing, mm -hmm. that's the map that shows the green around the perimeter of the property in different shades of green. And what they did was they identified any of the slopes over 10%, 10 to 20%, 20 to 30, and over 30. Those are really the regulated slopes in terms of the, the hillside development. Um, so none of the plus 30 is being disturbed, from what I can tell here. Um, looks like 2,800 square feet of 20 to 30. And Paul, jump in if I'm off with any of these numbers. And 13,500 square feet in the 10 to 20 foot range. Really, the main focus is in that northwesterly corner of the property to the rear of the existing office building where that slope was cut in to accommodate the 
the prior office building. So th this brings me to the question, most importantly, does this change any of the drainage calculations or any of the improvement testimony that we had in the last meeting? Because I left the last meeting assuming that this project was going to improve dramatically the situation with wastewater at the Vossler intersection, which has recently been closed during the flood conditions, would help potentially the Glen Road residents and just overall create a safer environment for wastewater at that site. Correct, and, and I would say that I do not think it impacts any of the prior testimony. The proposed improvements that are being offered are still the same as what they were at the prior meeting. So. I don't want to minimize because the hillside development is an important ordinance. Um, if this was a vacant tract of land where we were removing a lot of trees and cutting into existing slopes, I would have a much greater concern because of the prior development, because of the extents that this applicant is going to with their drainage proposal. I don't think the numbers changing because there was a discrepancy in the way it was calculated impacts what the end result will be of the development. And the bottom line on this calculation, the overall numbers are still correct. The impervious is still correct. It was just the steep slope denominator that had a change and that ramped up dramatically exactly. the ratio. That's exactly correct. The, the, the FAR and the lot coverage that's calculated just based on the building that's proposed doesn't change. It's because when you apply the hillside development regs, it shrinks the developable amount of land that, as Paul said, that denominator of the equation shrinks. So instead of, instead of being whatever the, the 140 some thousand square feet, which is the actual land area, it shrinks down to 114 because of the the perimeter steep slope. Taking off my chairman hat, just as a board member, I'm very fond of the steep slope ordinance because it does protect raw land. In, in, in your opinion, does this calculation change really any of the development characteristics, putting outside your, your previous testimony on the drainage? Does it change any of the impacts on neighborhood, on lighting, on any of the other testimony factors? I think the biggest potential impact would be the aesthetic. And I think we're hearing and we're seeing from the renderings, we're hearing from some of the enhanced landscaping that's being offered, that some of those impacts could be minimized. So I would say because of where the existing office building is, because of the fact that the slopes are previously developed, I don't think this changes any of the prior testimony. That's Thank, my opinion. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman. So. That, that was going to be my question. So what we're saying is these have already been disturbed. This, new, this project is not disturbing something new. Is that what we're saying? It's existing? Or are they cutting into something and creating a new issue? Based on the plans that have been presented, it appears to me, because when you take a look at where all the steep slopes are located existing today, it's adjacent to where the, the existing detention basin was cut in. It's directly behind the parking lot, behind the existing office building where that was cut in. Right. So in my review, it appears to me that those slopes were either created or exacerbated to accommodate the prior development. Right. It doesn't prior. appear to me that there's any new slopes that are steep, that are being disturbed at this point. Great, thank you. That, that's, that was my question, thank you. Uh, I've got a question before we sure. move on. Um, Mr. Winters, I'm looking at table one from the planner's letter dated March 21, and I'm looking at the uh, floor area row in that table, and I'm looking specifically at the proposed column, which shows 0.693, but which you've now corrected to be 0 0.905, right? Yes. The square footage that went with 0 0.693 was 103,882. What is it with the 0 0.905? It remains unchanged. The, so the square area footage is the same. Correct. The well, building is the same size as what was presented. Um, the, the, another way I could explain this is it's, um, Everything you've seen on the application, everything we've presented remains unchanged. And without 
without belittling, belittling the importance of the bulk standards or any number, it's, in this case, it's simply a number. It's a number that has changed because of it, but it hasn't changed the character or the, uh, the intent or the design of, of the lot. We just are clarifying it in context of the ordinance, so we're consistent with it. We Thank you. are making that correction. Any other related questions why on Why don't that? you go walk uh, through, because I think it's important in connection with this topic, oh, it, what the it, ordinance talks about in terms of the standard of approval for hillside development. So yes, it does. Just give me one moment to uh, put those papers back together so I can pick up uh, this evening's. <laughs> um, th this actually does make for a um, something of a convenient segue, because what, one thing we spoke about in preparation for this evening was we wanted to ensure that um, we had uh, up to this point provided a clear uh, basis to, to demonstrate that we're meeting this, the different standards of approval uh, that are part of the Hillside Development Ordinance. Um, and I, I believe we put testimony forth in support of all these, but for the board's uh, benefit um, and for the benefit of the application, I just wanted to brief, briefly run through those standards. I think that'll also help allay some of the uh, question that comes up of us making this clarification about <laughs> the floor area ratio. Um, and this, this is more reiterating some of the things we've spoken about. I'm not going into great detail because it's sort of a recap, but I just wanted to put it in context of those standards of approval. Um, so there's seven standards of approval listed in that Hillside Development Ordinance. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read them verbatim and just, just for record and then, and then quickly touch on them. Uh, number one, uh, control velocity and rate of water runoff so that such velocity and rate are no greater after construction and development than before, and all other provisions of the Bridgewater Township stormwater control and floodplain ordinance have been complied with. Now, based upon testimony given, we believe we've, we've achieved and we're compliant with this requirement. We have already put forth testimony that not only are we meeting the, the stormwater standards that we're required to meet, we're exceeding, we're going beyond that and providing additional uh, detention. We are allowing that uh, stormwater storage to pr produce greater reductions in rates of runoff from the site. Um, and and we're, we're going above to provide those things. As, as noted, we're reducing impervious cover over the existing condition. Um, we had previously given testimony that the project site is exempt from the floodplain ordinance since there is no floodplain or flood hazard areas as regulated by the DEP on the site. And we, we've addressed the provisions of the Bridgewater Township stormwater control ordinances. So we've, we've satisfied, I believe, um, the, uh, the requirements of, of point one, of standard one. Uh, standard two of, of uh, the ordinance states, minimize stream turbidity and changes in flow. Um, now, by, by virtue that there is no stream directly on our site, I could, I could easily say this is not necessarily applicable to us, but ju just understanding that, of course, we're in close proximity to streams, I'll take it a step further and, and again point back to the uh, stormwater management improvements that we are providing, which again are above and beyond the requirements. We're providing additional there because we can and because we're willing to. Um, and, and we believe that those improvements will result in a net benefit to downstream areas and to any stream and streams that are downstream of us. So whether it's applicable or not, I would say we've, we've even achieved that standard. Um, standard number three states, protect environmentally vulnerable areas. Um, by virtue of the fact that this is a redevelopment and the fact that this site has been entirely developed Prior to this point, I mean, we're, we're placing our development in a previously developed area. Um, there's no flood hazard areas, no wetlands areas. Um, we're, we're addressing um, all, all proposed slopes will be stable. That's a requirement for all development, and I'm going to touch on that again in a moment in, in relation to another of these points. So I, I believe we've, we've achieved that through the type of development we're, we're proposing here uh, to, to meet that standard. Standard four states to stabilize exposed soils both during and after construction and development. Um, and I'm actually gonna also read standard five because my response to both is, is similar. Standard five states prevent soil slippage. And although it doesn't define it in there, I generally understand that to be cases where the, the ground may 
come loose because of, of conditions or, or rainfall or, or whatnot. Um, both of these standards, um, I believe since this, this project, like all projects that are uh, obligated to be approved by the local soil conservation district, in this case it's the Somerset Union Soil Conservation District, will have to review and approve this plan. In fact, uh, we already have that approval, I, I do want to note. Um, but our development has to comply with the standards for soil erosion and sediment control in New Jersey. All post-development slopes must be stable. Um, we, we don't get a final sign-off from, from the uh, conservation district if, if the site is unstable before, uh, before we wrap up construction. So I, I believe we will address through construction um, that everything will be stabilized in point four. And, and we have no concern for the soil slippage requirement of 0.5 because we are, we are reducing or minimizing steep slopes and anything on there that's man-made will be stabilized. Um, point, excuse me, standard six states, minimize the number and extent of cuts to prevent groundwater discharge areas. And that seems to contemplate um, affecting groundwater conditions of, uh, that might be affected by, by excavations. And, uh, Again, I believe we're compliant with this because it's a pre-developed site. Uh, we're seeking to change as little of the site as possible. Much of our proposed development falls directly within the footprint of the prior development. Um, the building is at a similar elevation for the most part as the parking lot is. Um, so I, I believe we're complying with this because we're, we're really retrofitting our project into the existing site uh, as best as can be for redevelopment. It, it, it meets that standard. Um, and as I noted, we're also reducing impervious cover overall from the existing conditions. So we're, we're, we have that benefit to add to that. And lastly, standard seven uh, states preserve maximum number of trees and other vegetation on the site and avoid the critical upland forest areas as shown on the vegetation map of the township's natural resources inventory. Now that last point, I, we, we also, I believe, are compliant with this and that last point um, we, we don't encroach into those areas per the, the natural resource inventory, but I, I want to point out in addition to the landscaping we're proposing, as I noted in prior testimony, um, we've, with the reduction in building in the latest version of the plans that's before the board for consideration, um, we've been able to pull our development footprint further from the property perimeter. That's allowed us to save numerous trees that are uh, providing some very nice buffer, buffer that was visible in, I forget which exhibit, but one of the exhibits that Mr. Nacella presented again this evening. Uh, we're, we're preserving a number of those existing trees, especially along Donahue where they are. Um, so we're, we're really maximizing uh, the number of trees we could save, minimizing those off-site and on-site impacts. And as, as previous testimony showed, we're, we're proposing um, a, a significant quantity of new trees, new shrubs. So. As I said, I think we're compliant with that. Um, so uh, again, that's, those are those seven standards and for the board's benefit and for record, I just wanted to ensure we had run through those in context of what we'd offered before and I, I believe we addressed those. But of course, I'm willing to entertain any other questions on that past testimony if the board has them. I have um, a question that hopefully will clear this up for me and maybe some of the other people. I know you're talking in technical terms about the computation that was done and the math that was used in order to come to a consistent outcome between Mr. Burr's calculations and yours. Is that fair to say so far? Yes, we want to provide a consistent computation to the ordinance, which we don't believe we had prior. We thought we did, and we wanted to clear that up for record, so we're okay. consistent. And, and now that you've completed these calculations, does this impact the variances that you requested or the degree to which the lot coverage is going to be impacted so you're asking for something more than we thought you were going to ask i, I can address that because it's it's a it's a question regarding the variance intensity and yes uh, that's that's the very reason we're, we're providing this testimony is to make clear to the board we're not hiding anything that that once this was determined uh that we wanted to be clear that what we're asking for and hold ultimately hopefully uh, get a vote to approve for is the correct calculations under your ordinance. So uh, there was reference before to the planner's letter and, and, and table A or one, I believe it was, uh, from the planner's March 21 letter. That would be revised and the variance we're seeking would be a variance uh, for the point nine zero five um, computation. 
And just to clear up the numbers again, the requirement is a maximum floor area ratio of 0.25. The relief we are seeking with this calculation fixed is uh, for a floor area ratio of 0 0.905. This isn't a new variant, so you were never close it's, it's to 0.25. This, this is a number of what we, right. we had already had the variance among those seats. Right. It sounded that this was new and above, but no, the, I, you needed this all along. Okay. We, we always needed this. We just were correcting the number, so it's correct per record. So the degree of magnitude that you've increased it is from 0.25 to 0.90? No, no, 0.25 is the ordinance limitation. We were okay. always seeking a variance, and we were at 0 0.693, so about 0 0.7, and now we're at 0.905, so about 0.9, so about okay. Thank you. Now, I, I had you at one iteration from Scarlett's appendix, uh, 0.87. So, I mean, this number has been flying around. Well, we had this, there were three different iterations, as, as Paul mentioned, the original application under this computation would have been over 1, 1.131. So the board will, this must well, have we, been we had three different iterations that we came to the board with. So your, your testimony is at your 0 0.905. Correct. Thank you. Does that mean that the existing calculation is incorrect? Because it, it, Sherman says it's 0 0.18 or 27. So that, that actually, that's a very good question, and that does mean the existing calculation as on our submitted plan is, is incorrect as well in the same way that ours was. Um, the, uh, that 0.18 floor area ratio for the existing building, that does not take into account the, the, the steep slope number because, that's, because we had applied it to. Our original calculation said, oh, we reduced the floor area ratio requirement from 0.25 to 0.192. We, that was the part that we, uh, we misunderstood because there are, there are some. In fact, the other provisions of the Hillside Development Ordinance, the ones for impervious cover, those do stipulate we reduce the bulk standard, which is unlike this one where we apply the reduction to the, uh, the math, to, to the, the lot area for calculating it. That 0.18 we calculated on the original application for the existing building when we apply the hillside development factor is 0.24. So the existing building using that calculation is 0.24 floor area ratio. That existing building is therefore just under the 0.25. One other question on that, the uh, improvements on the drainage, is there any, any way to quantify what those improvements will mean for the community in the area? I mean, will it prevent certain flooding conditions that we've had in the past, or is it just going to make them a little better? Just so I understand the question, so when, when Mr. Winters testified last time, there was, I believe you gave percentages above for the 30-year, 100-year storm, all, all that. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I was just trying, we, the, what I had heard in the testimony was it's going to improve it. Yes. Being able to, if someone in the area. That, the, that's yeah, the, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to. I, and I, I understand the, the concern and confusion because on, on the uh, regulatory side, the, the main way that they determine if we're compliant is based on peak rates of runoff for certain design storm events. And if you meet those reductions, um, then you comply. And in this case, and if you bear with me, I have the uh, supplemental information that I'm digging through last, uh, last time's notes. Just give me one moment, please. Mm -hmm. Ah, here they are. So there's, there's going to be some numbers, so bear with me. <laughs> um, the, um, there's, there's different storm events, if you're not familiar with them. The design storms, um, are, then they're, they're based on percentage frequencies that they may occur, and, and based upon that, we tend to call them by the frequency in years, which is not always true. That doesn't mean the 100-year storm only happens once in 100 years. We all know that, but um, I, th I think we've heard that one by now. But um, the, the storm events are the two-year event, the 10-year event, and the 100-year event. Um, normally, we will comply if we reduce the peak rate of the two-year storm event from the existing, like the, the current rate that might run off of the site today, by 50% of that. That's considered compliant. And we had calculated we were reducing that rate by 72%. So it, almost 50% on top of that 50% reduction. So 
and before I move on. What, what that means is um, the detention system, the, the storage we provide on site to hold back more water from immediately running off of the site. Um, we hold back a little additional water, and when we do that, the amount of water that's immediately running off of the site during a rainfall event is held back further. So there's even less water running off below the threshold we're permitted to let it run off the site. We're holding back even more. And what happens is we hold it back for a much longer period of time. When the rain stops, water may still be coming out of these detention systems, but by that point, the peak of the storm has passed. And that's pretty much the general principle of why we do detention for storm water events. It's for, for storm events, it's to take some of the pressure off of what's downstream. And that's important because we've heard it, uh, I've, I've heard it from the, from the board and from the um, from the board's professionals, the concern is downstream capacity, whether that's storm systems that are downstream or uh, water courses and streams that are downstream. Uh, and with that in mind, that's the reason why we've, we've uh, uh, agreed to, to find a means to provide this additional storage to hold back more water, take more pressure off of the downstream. And that's allowed me to say that, yes, there will be an improvement in downstream capacity because this project is holding back even more water and reducing those peak rates more during a storm event. Sorry for the long explanation. It's, it's my area. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the two-year rate. Do you want to go and give us the other year? 10 and 100. Sure thing. I, no, I'd be happy to. And, and again, these were, these were testimony last time, and I have, I have no, no problem reiterating those. The 10-year uh, the, the event where we're required to uh, uh, achieve a 25% reduction in the, in the peak rates of runoff uh, we're going to be achieving a 56% reduction with the additional storage we're providing. And for the 100-year event where a 20% reduction is required, uh, we have calculated we'll achieve a 33% reduction. So, so even if we weren't going above the 100-year event, the meaning of what you just said, the statement that our project will improve the runoff capacity, so we're going even above the 100%. That, yes, that's correct. This is a good opportunity. Uh, yes, yes. Um, since we're on the, the everything flows tonight, we're on the stormwater topic, and that gives me a chance just to uh, talk about a matter that that did come up briefly in the past hearing, and um, I, I had a chance to um, uh, look at this and speak with the board engineer a little bit after uh, the last meeting, um, and uh, there was a question that came up as to whether we could provide any additional measures uh, on the west side of the site. Uh, regarding stormwater management, and I testified that um, we are we are compliant and we remain compliant with the rules uh, throughout the site. On the west side of the site, um, we are already redirecting uh, two tenths of an acre, about uh, 20 percent, uh, approximately 20 percent of the total area towards the detention and stormwater systems on the east side of the site. And that's, that volume of runoff is accounted for. So we're reducing areas that run off directly, and we're meeting our obligations by doing that. But the question came up as to whether anything else could be done to um, further uh, assist and improve uh, the runoff from the west side of the site, which today and in the future is directly discharges without any detention. Um, we believe there's an opportunity to provide some kind of measure on that side and, and had spoken with the board engineer about maybe being able to do something. It would be something small, something that may serve to um, deter some of the more frequent smaller events and just take some of that water offline during those. Uh, and we're, we're happy to, uh, to work with them uh, to, uh, to, to work that into the design. And I just wanted the board to be the aware. The garden that Bill was mentioning last time and some other smaller yeah. mitigation yeah. measures? It, it, yeah, I think that's great. That, that may be the solution um, for that, and it, we, we're, we're happy to look at that. The, the applicant is agreeable that we, we'd want to provide something else there that we can. Um, we just need to work out the specifics. It'll be a small bit of mitigation, is that your testimony, but it'll be in, an improvement? Yes, we're, we're, we will make a, an additional improvement to that side. That'll just one more thing above and beyond the, the requirements we have, just because we know it's a concern of the boards, and we think we can do something there. So we're going to endeavor to do that and, and coordinate that with Mr. Burr. Yes. Any other board members' questions for Mr. Winters? All right, board professionals, any follow-up? I, I just had one comment unrelated to um, 
the updated calculations. Um, last hearing, um, it was uh, a member of the public brought, brought up a comment related to the loading zones um, and that the, and I just wanted to um, make it more apparent or at least address it, um, that the requirement uh, under section 126-177B uh, there's a table and it outlines different uses and then kind of has, for certain uses, has a sliding scale as the, the square footage, the gross square footage gets higher that the number of loading spaces increases with it. I jumped into this application midway, so I apologize for, for oh, missing the, that. And the number of loading spaces did change based on the on this, the size of the building when they updated the plan. But it appears that um, for whatever reason, I think previously the loading space requirement of one loading space was based off of that table and the only kind of congruent use I can think that it was based off of was the office use because the office use basically says if there's 10,000 square feet or more, you need one loading space. Whereas I think probably the more appropriate categorization would be the retail commercial, planned commercial section which has that kind of sliding scale which would require a building that's 50 to 75,000 square feet of gross floor area to have four loading spaces. Now they're proposing two loading spaces, one of them which meets the dimensional requirements of 12 by 50, one of them which does not, it's proposed to be 10 by 32. I think simply that the applicant will just have to put on testimony related to a variance for that requirement. So the planner would hit that? We'll have our planner address that, yeah. Is that good? Thank you. I think you got it. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any questions at this point. I guess the only the only thing I would add is a a comment about the drain the additional drainage that is being proposed on the west side of the building. In my view, it's certainly a welcome addition, being that it's only been two weeks since the last meeting. I understand Mr. Winters hasn't had a chance to do a deep dive into the design, but I think there's the opportunity to add another stormwater feature near that westerly drive, driveway that would really have a positive impact, so. Um. I, I appreciate it. I've, I've been lighting up your cell phone over this. I, I really wanna make sure that the neighbors see a, a, a net and a gross improvement in, in, in runoff, and I uh, appreciate you working with the applicant on this. Understood. And continue to work and, and come up with a better plan. Thank you. All right, with that, I'm gonna open it up to members of the public for Mr. Winter's engineering testimony. Whoever's ready, ready golf. Great, come on down. Juan Cruzea. Sir, you would agree that the floor area ratio requirement without a steep slope is 0.25, correct? I'm sorry, I missed the number. Could you repeat that, sir? Okay. Without a steep slope, the, the maximum floor area ratio requirement is 0.25 under the ordinance. Yes, that's, it's 0.25, um, and if it wasn't clear from what I said, the floor area ratio requirement in the zone is 0 0.25, uh, regardless of the steep slope, uh, the um, hillside ordinance requirement, it stays at the 0.25. It's the uh, calculation of what we're providing that is varied by that ordinance section, just, just to be abundantly clear. But in effect, for the steep slope situation, the, floor area, the maximum floor area ratio requirement is 0.193. That was what our prior representation was, and, and the purpose of this testimony was to amend that, that um, it is, does not actually change. What changed was not that bulk standard, but the calculation of what our proposed floor area under that ordinance has changed. So the 0.25 remains the same. It was our calculation of, um, and just because it's better with numbers than explanation, the cal sorry, wrong testimony. The calculation of 0.693 that we had represented previously is amended now, it's 0 0.905 when, when done per that. So that, that was the clarification. Okay. So to meet the floor area ratio requirement 
and not have to require a variance for that requirement. The way I read this table is your floor area can be 37,475 square feet for this building, correct? Uh, I haven't performed the math to verify that, so I'll, I'll rely upon your number for this discussion. Well, that's the number that's in the table, as I understand it. I'll just, because it's the table I prepared. Oh, th yes, thank I you. Also, I was about to ask I which can table. also assist, I guess, in some of the question answering, or at least clarifications. Um, the 37,475 square feet, that's gross floor area in total in any building floor um, cumulative, is based off of the entire lot area. After the hillside development calculation, so the number below that, the 0.192, um, is how it initially was calculated by the applicant, but the number below that, the square footage number, the 28,781, is actually the true, uh, I guess, adjusted allowance under the hillside development calculation. So the, real, the number that they'd be allowed with the hillside development calculation would actually be 28,781. Okay, and based upon the request for a variance, well, based upon the floor area ratio of 0 0.905, what is the applicant actually seeking? That, that, that number is exactly the same as you see in the, the, the far column, or the second to last column. 103,882 square feet is the gross square footage that's being uh, re requested. So that would actually be, depending upon which number you rely on as the standard, that would actually be about four to five times what's permitted under this ordinance. Correct? Not four times. It, it's about a little over three times. Okay, so it would be the ratio of 0 0.905 divided by 0 0.25, which is something less, slightly less than four. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. But in terms of the volume, I mean, the total difference in square feet. That's an additional, and I'm doing these in round numbers, that would be an additional 60,000 plus square feet, going from 37,475 to 103,882, correct? Say the first number again? Well, the first number is 37,475. Are you sure? Yes. And then the request is based upon a number what appears to be 103,882 square feet, which in round numbers, well, I'll do it a little closer, is 60, roughly 65,000 square feet. Okay. And, sir, we've heard your testimony, and, and you're relying on tables that are based upon assumptions, correct? We're relying on tables that are based upon the calculations from the ordinance section, and all we were seeking was just to clarify the numbers this evening. I thought, I thought your testimony was based upon tables that are not part of this ordinance, but are part of, I guess, state guidelines. You identified... You're, you're, you, you're now referring to the stormwater calculations? Yes. Okay, that's okay. moving on to a different a thing. Totally different issue, but understood. Um, I, I just want, okay, your question then, I'm sorry. That's what you're relying on, to rationalize that maybe this, maybe this will work in this location. I, I think we've presented that um, we are meeting the requirements obligated to this site. We're going above those on the stormwater side, and that's supportive of variances we are seeking. And again, in context of this particular issue with the numbers we have, given testimony and presented, we've, we've brought down the size of the building 20% from the original proposal already as part of our efforts to um, advance this application and, and demonstrate that we can, uh, I guess, best fit, as, as I'll borrow that from what we were talking about, uh, the use of this site. So we've, we've demonstrated this through our testimony. But Bridgewater still has the ordinance. And bringing the building down to about 103,892 square feet is still almost four times what that ordinance permits. 
And is still a okay. significant reduction from our original and, and application, it, yes. And, and, and you believe it's an acceptable situation now because you're relying on tables for which certain assumptions were made to arrive at those tables and attempt to utilize them. I don't know that this witness can answer what, what acceptable situation means. Okay. I'll withdraw that question. Now, the young lady back there told, she lives on, one of the young ladies, both of those young ladies live on, live on Glen Road. One of them testified. And they have a real world problem. The real world problem is they're basically downhill a bit from where the subject property is located. And they have an unabated water problem. Nobody's attempted to explain it, rationalize it, minimize Well, maybe you've attempted to minimize it with your testimony. But there's been nothing concrete that you've put forth to this board that addresses head on or minimizes what goes on on the north side or west side of Route 22 and how it affects the people on the side. Sir, this is time for questions, really. Is, are you getting to a question? Yeah, the question was, you've done nothing to minimize. That was the question. I, I think we've already given, we have already given testimony uh, that the uniqueness of this application where we're reducing total impervious cover, we're providing additional stormwater uh, management measures above and beyond the minimum required that this application is in a unique position to improve the stormwater conditions okay. within our control on our site. Okay. But if you brought it within the maximum floor area ratio requirement of Bridgewater Township's ordinance that appears to be directly applicable to this case, you would have a building that would be substantially smaller than what you're proposing. Correct? That would be correct. If you didn't want an ordinance, if you didn't want to get a variance from this particular requirement, you wouldn't have what's up on those screens right now. Correct? If that was the objective, but that's conjecture now. Um, I didn't hear that. that. That was what? Conjecture. What's conjecture about it? You asking a question that I'm answering. I'm just, I'm stating the fact that you're stating. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to understand your question better. Well, let, let me withdraw that one. Isn't this case for the board's benefit really about balancing the single problem, water? And isn't it about trying to minimize what's going to happen in the area. And, and I didn't know about the Vossler Avenue problem. And I think the broad border to everybody's attention. And it turns out, it turned out to be a very serious problem. And that's probably within 100 feet of your application or your subject property. You agree with that? If not 100 feet, a couple hundred feet? Is your question to the witness whether the, sing the purpose of this application is to reduce the stormwater? Because that's what you just said. What I'm getting at is, in effect, what this application is really focusing in on is balancing the interest of the, of the people who are probably being affected by it in terms of water flow versus the ability to overdevelop this property such that you'll get a variance of the maximum floor area ratio of 0.905 when either 0.25 or 0.192 is what's required. You know, just to put this question into context, I just want to point out a fact that this project is taking a property that has a small amount of building and a large amount of parking, and it's replacing it with a large amount of building and a small amount of parking. And while that may require a floor area ratio, we are reducing the total impervious cover on the site as a result of this development. It might require a floor area variance in this case, but we think it's an improvement over, it is an improvement over that existing condition. We are reducing that impervious cover, even though it requires this variance relief. But you can't come to this board with any evidence to say that the water problem in the area will not exist to the extent that- It hasn't been control. the testimony. And it's been substantiated by the township engineer that the flows off site will be reduced as a result of this development. I don't want to get into a debate with you. The answer is you're being asked to give a significant variance to the floor area ratio requirement, very significant. 
And if you look at the magnitudes, Bridgewater said when they enacted this ordinance, okay, we're concerned about something, and it sounds like sir, we're concerned sir, about We're not going to debate right now. If you want to come and give That's a statement. Closing. At, at, I'm sorry. I'm done. You can, be, you can ask more questions of the testimony. No. At the end of when the applicant has wrapped up their case, you can give as much testimony as you want. You can give a speech if you want. I'll give you all the time you want. Done. Now is not the time. Well, if you're done, then leave. Well, I'm sitting down, but you wanted to keep talking, so I wouldn't leave while you're well, talking. I like to talk. But clearly, you do too. I'm doing what I want. We're open to the public. Well, I'm going to sit down right now. That's great, because we're going to take a break, and I think the board needs a break, and we're going to reconvene in five minutes. Thank you. Ten minutes.
All right, it's 9.10, we're gonna reconvene. Roger, get a quick roll call, please. Here. Uh, here. 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 All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Melnick. Chairman. Okay, to my right is uh, our professional planner, um, Paul Ricky, who I will ask to put his qualifications on the record. Yeah, that's yeah. Did, did we finish? I just want to make sure we yeah, finish across did, from, we, the, from the public. Did all members of the public get to ask all the questions? You guys are good? All right, then we've completed that. Sorry, just Thanks. wanted to make sure. Thanks, Rick. Again, Mr. Ricky. Yes, and I'll just remind you that you are still under oath. <clears throat> uh, for the record, my name is Paul Ricky, R-I-C-C-I. -C -C -I. I'm a licensed professional planner. I've been licensed since the year 2000. I'm also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, a national recognition. I have a master's degree in city and regional planning, which I received from Rutgers University in 1997. Uh, I'm currently a planning consultant to, to six communities. I, I testify uh, regularly in front of boards. I've been qualified uh, approximately 250 boards throughout the state. I, I have testified in front of this board three or four times over the years. All right, uh, the board accepts you. Good Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Ricky, can you identify uh, what you've been asked to do in relation to this application? Uh, yes, I was asked to prepare or formalize a, a planning opinion as to the appropriateness of this application. And that would include the variances and other waivers that are being sought? Yes. 
Uh, why don't you walk the board through uh, what, what you've done and where your conclusions are with respect to those? Uh, sure. Is it, is it important for me to, to recognize again on the record the variances that were requested, or has that been just? I think it would be good if you okay. did. Okay. You know, there's been so many changes in them, and we have an yeah. updated report, but I, I do think it would be clearer if you identified and, each and one. It helps you. My scoreboard is we started at about 24, and now we're hovering around 12, maybe 13, depending on your interpretation. One of which has changed tonight. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, okay. We're seeking the D1 use firings to permit the self-storage facility in your C5 commercial nursing home district. The floor area ratio variance, D4 to permit an FAR of 0 0.905, where a maximum of, of 0 0.25 is permitted. And I'll discuss some of those nuances through my testimony. Um, minimum front yard uh, facing Donahue, 75 feet is required, where 49.3 feet is proposed. Uh, minimum front yard to Route 22, 75, excuse me, um, 75 feet is required on the underlying zoning, 200 feet is required with the, um, the, the, the additional standards in place where 54.1 feet is proposed, 44.9 feet previously existed, rear yard setback of 75 feet is required where 49.3 feet is proposed. Maximum improved lot coverage after slope calculations, and there was some discussion about this last time, 40% is permitted and 48% is proposed. Uh, to permit a conservation easement of 25 feet, where 50 feet is required adjacent to the single family residential zone. Um, and I'll talk about this through my testimony. This is not being changed with the exception of the fire lane that's being added, and we're adding landscaping to that area as well. Uh, minimum landscape buffer along Route 22, 100 feet is required, where 28 to 33 feet uh, is proposed, and I'll talk about that as well. This is largely uh, unchanged. Uh, Off-street parking to Route 22, 100 feet is required, where 28.5 feet is proposed to the driveway, and 54 feet to parking where 29 feet previously existed. Uh, Off-street parking to Donahoe, 75 feet is required where 32 feet is proposed and where 25 feet previously existed. To permit loading in the front yard and for not providing four loading bays, only two, one of which is conforming in, in size, um, 12 by 50 feet is required. Uh, the other loading area is 10 feet by 32 feet. And to permit a three-story building where two stories is proposed, um, and that's due to the grade changes that were discussed. That is the extent of variances that I, that I have. Can you also go through uh, the standards? Sure. The board is to apply to those use and multi-use. Sure. Uh, as the board is, is aware, uh, in order to grant uh, a C2, or excuse me, a, a D1 use variance, uh, the, the special reason that's, that's most uh, in, in line with the proofs is to show that a, a site is particularly well suited for the use. If a site is particularly well suited, it promotes the, the general welfare of the community. It can also advance special reasons, but purpose A is the, is the most important. Um, the use variance also has to be granted without a substantial detriment to the public good. That's namely the adjoining property owners without a substantial intent and purpose of your zone plan. And for the D1 variance, that has to be through an enhanced burden of proof, the Mendici criteria to reconcile the emission of the use from the municipal master plan. Uh, the, the D4 use variance is, you know, it's, it's, it's a little less onerous in terms of being, meet, meeting the standards. Uh, to meet the positive criteria, we have, we have to show that the site has the ability to accommodate the increased floor area ratio and for all variances, we have to show that they can, they can be granted without a substantial detriment into the zone plan. I mean, that Medici criteria technically does not apply for the, for, the, for the D4 variance, but we need to meet it anyway for the D1 variance. And I, I defer to the, the board attorney. Uh, while we, I'm going to go through each bulk standard individually, but it's, it's commonplace that 
under a D1 use variance because there aren't specific standards for use not permitted in the zone that the board evaluated an application uh, collectively. Um, and because under the law, it's, it's understood that those variances are subsumed into the use variance. With that said, I'm going to discuss each one of those specific deviations uh, in, from a bulk perspective as to their appropriateness. And I, I defer to the board attorney how he wishes to move forward, but nonetheless, I'm going to discuss it. I do uh, think you should address each of the C's because while some of them may be subsumed into the D1, not all of them are, and I, I honestly think it's just better to address them all. Okay, and I'm going to address them nonetheless. Okay, my variance is, my, excuse me, my variance. My, my testimony is, is pretty detailed. I have a pretty lengthy uh, outline, so I'm going to have to reply, uh, rely on my outline uh, a little bit more than I, than I traditionally do when I, when I testify. Um, so just, just be aware of that. It's not usually my, my, my style, per se. Um, re regarding the, the particular suitability, uh, just beginning with the, the C5 nursing home district, uh, this is one district in Bridgewater Township that has a total of four lots. Uh, two of those lots are non-conforming single-family residential lots uh, that are approximately one acre in area where, where, where three acres is required. Then you have the CARE One assisting living, living facility, which is next door, uh, and then the subject property, which historically has been used uh, for office space. Uh, permitted uses in the C5 district today are nursing homes, continuing care retirement facilities, congregate care facilities, assisted living facilities in senior housing, general offices, and medical dental offices. It conditionally permits service stations, and we know there's a service station just a few properties down uh, from the site as well. So as a planner, I think it's clear that there's a limited number of uses permitted for this very small district in town. Uh, here, I believe that the applicant proposes to adaptively reuse this site uh, and to design an attractive self-storage facility. And again, I think this was already brought out through testimony, the self-storage facility is not a warehouse, and that's clear under your ordinance. And these are for residential type users of the design of these facilities. And it was, testimony was also discussed that the largest unit size throughout this facility is about 200 square feet uh, in area. Um, I've testified for, for several uh, self-storage facilities over the year. Over the years, I've also reviewed them and recommended them uh, in towns that, that, that I represent as, as a, an appropriate intermittent use on where a commercial use adjoins a residential use. Um, the reason that, that I've recommended it in the past is because for commercial land uses, this is one of the most passive land uses that exist. And also, um, when you look at a, a building, uh, from, from, from my perspective, what I recommend it was close to, to Route 1 and 9. Um, it also sound, acts as a, as a buffer wall from, from highway noise in the context when you have buildings as well. So um, there's, there's, there's multiple reasons why um, having a passive building it can be positive uh, in, in this context. Uh, I, I did look at the number of vehicles that, that do travel past this site, um, approximately 60,000 vehicles traveling by a property do also uh, impact my opinion as why this is an appropriate location uh, for a self-storage facility. Uh, today, the site contains an office building, as the, as the board is aware. Um, it's been information by the applicant that's provided to me is that approximately 50 to 80 percent of, of the building is, is vacant. And I, I think most of the board likely recognizes since post-COVID that there's just less demand for office use today. So I did look at um, some statistics in the area. Uh, generally speaking, when there is existing supply of office space, you don't build new office space. Uh, an exception to that would be if, if Apple or a very specific user were coming in that needed a very specific space, they may build new space, but generally it's more expensive to build new space if there's existing supply. So. Um, I evaluated the demand and need for, for office space uh, in the area. A uh, couple of numbers, 
according to Office Snapshot by Lee and Associates, uh, Somerset County area had an office vacancy rate of 16% in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, JLL, um, that's another real estate services firm, reported 25.8% uh, office vacancy rate for Northern New Jersey uh, for 2023 quarter one. Um, and, and these numbers that I'm, I'm indicating, these aren't just Somerset County numbers. These are, these are numbers that are, are largely reflective of the state. Um, and, and New York City, you can argue, is have much higher rates. So these are numbers that are, are pretty much we're seeing uh, in a regional and, and, and likely a, a, a national level uh, as well. Uh, I did, when I spoke to the applicant, I said, you know, was there any interest in the, the adjoining um, assisted living facility the, the, uh, to expand onto the site? Because that seemed to be an, an option for this zone. And um, the applicant in to me, indicated to me that they had no interest in expanding to this portion of the site. So you have an applicant that's looking at, I have a, I have a zone that's essentially zoned for, for office and uh, you know, assisted living type facilities and there's no demand for office. Mr. Ricky, can I just put you on hold for one second? C can I help you? He's, he's, I think that's what professional planners do. He's reporting on the, the statistics that he is relying on for the basis of where he's heading in, in this report. I think that's what professional planners do. I can po provide the sites of my sources if that's I, needed. Provide those too, okay. sure. I, I thought you'd start it to do that. Before you continue, may I clarify one of the statistics you mentioned? Uh, the 60,000 cars, is that per week, per day, per month? That's the approximate traveling by the property daily, and that's taken from um, uh, NJDOT website. So when looking at what's permitted in the zone um, and what there is need for, it was my conclusion that there, there isn't a need for additional office space and uh, at least the, the most adjacent uh, assisted living facility had no uh, desire to expand onto the property. So the applicant is in a position, how should this property best be utilized uh, moving forward? I already testified to, and I'll talk about this more in the, in the future, that self-storage facilities for commercial land use are, are one of the most passive land uses that exist in the marketplace today. Once these facilities are, you know, they're, they're, when they're, once they're filled, um, there, there's very little activity that, that occurs on them. Um, I, I personally visited facilities uh, because often I also do some work for AT&T and cell tower companies where I've been on facilities uh, where they were looking to locate a cell tower, uh, passive use with a passive use, and I've been on the facilities for hours, and I've seen like zero to one or, like, I don't recall seeing any cars coming on to a facility uh, in the Morristown area. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're very passive facilities, and, and I'm going to talk about that more moving forward. Um, in, in terms of need and demand for this use, I'm going to summarize some of the testimony provided by the representative of, of, of the applicant, um, but that testimony indicated that there's current supply of 723,000 square feet of self-storage space in the five-mile trade area. Um, a total of 170,000 square feet of additional space was in approval stages, which totaled or totals 890,000 square feet, approximately, of, of inventory. <coughs> it indicated that the population in the trade area of 143,000 individuals results in a demand for over 1 million square feet of self storage space demand. Um, this proposed facility would help meet that unmet demand for the site. Um, I also found it um, compelling 
when the self storage representative uh, testified that much of the existing supply of self storage units are older properties that are single story that lack climate control and other amenities that modern buildings provide. So that what the applicant is looking to provide is largely not provided today and that based on this previous testimony that he indicated that the facility would capture at that time when the building was larger approximately 15% of the demand that's needed in the area. So it's, the development model is not geared towards capturing other businesses, self-storage tenants, but filling self-storage need for the area. I think there's the ability based on it, the information provided uh, for this facility to exist the, the facilities that exist today to re continue to exist because there's additional demand. Um, this is not similar to uh, a, a retail user that may came, come in and try to outcompete you to take your business away. And I think that's a clear distinction between what's proposed here, what's needed here, and other types of commercial activities. Um, um, here, again, this is an opportunity to repurpose the use into a, a year-round business that serves the needs of local residents. And again, I believe that this is an ideal transitionary land use between commercial activities and the nearby single-family residential activities up the hill. And again, because once these facilities are, are occupied, uh, they're, they're, they're rarely visited and they're passive commercial land uses. In comparison, the, kite, the site could be developed with medical offices, which have a lot more activity, parking needs, and the like that's constantly occurring, uh, as well as a gas station. Well, I don't think it would need this size of a lot, but alternatives that are, that are more intense um, than the proposed use. Uh, in, in terms of your master plan, um, I mean, the, the township has been active uh, in updating its master plan, and I, and I look through a a number of various versions. Um, and um, I can say that this application will support numerous goals of your master plan. From your 2015 master plan, encourage appropriate development of land use focus areas in the township that will, within the limits of zoning, return underutilized land to productive use, generate economic development activity, diversify the municipal economic base, create new employment opportunities, and strengthen the tax base. Um, the township had a specific 2010 master plan element, an economic element for the Route 22 corridor that was specific to Route 22. And this application would enhance several purposes of that master plan as well. Enhance and increase tax rateables through diversity of high value uses, support existing economic anchors, and encourage reinvestment into existing facilities, adjust to the contemporary needs of commerce and Bridgewater residents. That's clear that the master plan recognizes the need to adapt to the needs uh, of the community. Encourage long-term sustainable site planning, enable more flexibility in development context and promote economic activity in appropriate locations. This is a commercial zone, this is a growth area of the township or for building design guidelines where appropriate. And again, I think one of the distinguishing characteristics that I'll talk about about this facility is that it's been designed to look like an office building. Um, Self-storage facilities over the years have dramatically changed. And when, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, according to my analysis, when self-storage was planned, at least based on your, your master planning, was around 2004 when it was discussed in your 2004 master plan, self-storage facilities were completely different type of facilities. Um, I think most of us recognize these single-story facilities with a lot of garage doors. Now you have facilities that are completely climate-controlled with minimal amount of exterior doors, like proposed by the applicant, that appears to look like an office building. One of the negative problems with self-storage was not the use, but the visual impact of that use in an environment. Looking at those garage doors, the, the garish colors, the oranges, the bright colors and the like um, that, were, that were painted on those doors. 
And, and that's not proposed here. Uh, in the 2022 master plan, um, your most recent master plan, it says, in the extent where there have been significant changes in assumptions, policies, and objectives forming the basis of the master plan or development re regulations as last revised, it says, since the adoption of the amendments to the master plan reexamination report of April 27, 2015, there was a significant change in policy regarding the evaluation of the highway corridors and regulations which continue to encourage a mix of compatible uses without overburdening its residents with frustrating and inconvenient traffic congestion. And, and that's, again, one of the benefits of this self-storage facility, that it will have less traffic than permitted uses, um, again, a largely uh, passive uh, use. I think other benefits include uh, the removal of a, par a partially vacant, underutilized building, the positive influence resulting from the creation of a new business, uh, the creation of short and long-term jobs, uh, the creation of a safe, secure climate control space for personal items that will free up space for roomier, more comfortable living environments of residents. Uh, and it, it produces or places underutilized, unproductive land in an economic zone back to functional use. Um, re regarding uh, the floor area ratio, I mean, floor area ratio is it's an additional measure that's, that's added typically to a building coverage requirement. Um, um, it, it offers a way of, of, of predicting the ratio of, of persons to a, of a unit of land. It also is a means of regulating mass of a building. So it regulates uh, mass of a building and how it's, how it's viewed in a community uh, and how intense a property operates. And that's the number of people on the property, the level of activity occurs. Given again that this is uh, a zone that's intended for office space. Office again generates the need for a lot more cars than this type of facility. I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide some of those numbers uh, in a moment. Um, it's, it's my overall opinion that the proposed facility can accommodate the increased floor area ratio in a manner that will result in the creation of low intensity land use with his own plan calls for moderate intensity land uses. And regarding parking, I, I did the calculations of the parking needs of, of 100, just by way of a barometer, um, 103,887 square foot medical facility and, and this is not what would be proposed for a medical facility, but to give you an idea of the demand change, would require 467 parking spaces under the township code. And a general office would require 346 spaces. That's based on medical of 4.5 spaces per, per thousand square feet. And for general office, uh, one space for, for 300 square feet. A medical building in the current 27,556 square foot footprint would require 124 spaces and general office would require 92 spaces under your current ordinance today. Our use requires 14.5 spaces where 15 spaces are provided physically. That's 16 spaces per the new law with the EV credit. And in terms of building scale, uh, the proposed building has a height of 23.63 feet to the deck line, the roof, uh, and 25.63 tall to the parapet. And if, if you compare that to the maximum height of 35%, that equates to the building being between 36% and 48% lower than allowed by, by ordinance. And you heard from uh, there's been a lot of testimony about the design of the building, but the intent was to not have a building that was taller than the existing building uh, so that there would be really no change to the height and how that building presented itself to the, for the uphill residential uses. Also, a specific characteristic that I hope the board evaluates as part of this application is that this site is slightly over 1,000 feet in width. Um, 
The proposed building face is approximately 330 feet. So the building itself would still occupy approximately 33% of the actual frontage on the highway. It also will be 290 feet from the closest point of the adjoining assisted living facility uh, and approximately 180 feet from the nearest residential building me measured building uh, to building. So it's my finding that the, the subject property is well removed from the adjacent commercial land use and is significantly lower in elevation than residential properties to the north. The perimeter landscaping will remain in place as well as a green strip along Route 22 to help so soften the project. And also you've heard from the site engineer that over time the applicant is embellishing and adding to that landscaping uh, as well. So we have the buffer plantings to the north on Donahue as well. Um, buffers can't fully be provided uh, along Route 22 due to the existing sanitary sewer easement that was discussed. Um, one of the most compelling points that, that I found about this application, and this was again discussed tonight uh, by the applicant, is that the applicant's reducing the impervious coverage uh, associated with this property from approximately 44% to 40%. And you have, a, a as, as you're aware, a maximum improvement coverage as well. And, and that's here we're asking for, for 48%, where 40% is permitted, where 44% is existing. And you heard the testimony from the site engineer as well that 8% of that number is associated with that fire road that surrounds the building. So from an impervious coverage standpoint, uh, we're very close and, and, and functionally compliant with the intent and purpose of the zone plan. And it's the, the benefits of, social, of having that fire road as, as required by the fire department clearly outweigh its detriments. And you heard how that fire road would be delivered. It would, be, it would, be, it would look like lawn and grass. So while it is a physical improvement, it will not feel like one um, from afar. Um, you saw the architectural uh, renderings tonight. I think that clearly depicted that this building is not massive or, or out of scale uh, with its environment. And I think there were some suggestions to make some additional em architectural embellishments to the building, but the scale of the building is, is, is appropriate in this context. Could it be uh, modified somewhat to, to be better? Yes, but the scale is appropriate. Um, and so from a floor area ratio perspective, uh, uh, this facility will not result in a, in a substantial departure from your zone plan because the building will not be too large or out of scale, um, is limited in terms of intensity. Uh, it meets, that's in terms of reducing the needs for parking and, and population on the site. And also, I think it's important when you evaluate the floor area ratio, um, here, it's factoring the number is, is elevated due to slopes on the property, and those slopes are disturbed slopes. This is not a, a virgin area of town where the applicant's looking to come in and to do, ner do need uh, a forested area of the community. This is an already disturbed property. And, um, and also, the floor area calculation, that's, that's elevating the number, and also the floor area ratio is calculating two thirds of the first floor that is underground. Um, I would just point out that the two thirds of the floor that is underground, that is not adding additional mass to the site. And because this is a passive use, it's not increasing the number of population on the property. Um, uh, the, the amount of traffic and, and cars needed for this facility are, are already passive. So in terms of how it changes the intensity of the site, it does not. And most importantly, floor area ratio, in my opinion, one of the largest reasons that it's imposed is the control mass. Um, in, in terms of the, of the bulk variances, um, um, we're gonna re request the bulk variances both under the, the C1 hardship provisions as well as the, the flexible uh, C2 balancing. Um, and, I know the board is aware on the C1 hardship provisions, the applicant is entitled to bulk variance relief uh, by reason of narrowness, 
uh, or the shape of the specific piece of property, and as well as by reason of an extraordinary and accessible situation uniquely affecting a specific piece of property or the structures lawfully existing uh, thereon. Um, for the C2 variance relief, like any other variance, we have to demonstrate that the variance meets the purpose of Ms. Melanius law, and that can be drilled down under the Poland decision, uh, the positive criteria associated from the use variance, and also that that variance can be granted without a substantial detriment to the public good in zone plan, where the board finds that um, if the benefits of granting the variances outweigh the detriments and it results in better zoning for the property, those are all reasons that, that justify the granting of bulk variance relief. Uh, simply stated for this property, you heard from the site engineer to begin, there is no buildable footprint on this property from a zoning perspective. Anything that is built here would require variance relief. That's due to the, the irregular shape of the property, as well as uh, increased setbacks that are required um, for this site uh, based on uh, your zoning code. And again, this is a lot uh, that does meet the minimum lot area requirements for the zone. It's 3.44 acres where three acres is permitted. And despite that, there is no building for footprint uh, that is permissible today. Mr. Ritchie. Yes. It's 945. I just want to give you a heads up I'm looking at the calendar and the docket. There's 15 minutes left in this meeting. I'll give you an extra five minutes. But June 11th is our next meeting after that. And so I wanted you to know that. I wanted you to hear it. I'm not going to tell you how to do your application. These are all very important topics. We need to hit on all the information. But I wanted to give you a warning that we have 15 minutes left tonight. And there is not another meeting. We have warehouse cases. We have cell tower cases. These are not small cases. The next available night is June 11th. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, with, with that said, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, regarding the appropriateness of, of the setbacks, despite there not being uh, setbacks that are permitted, um, that there being no building footprint, um, um, the building would be located slightly further back than the existing front yard setback facing Route 22 today. Um, we retain the existing side yard setback adjacent to the nursing home, and in the widest portion of the lot, approximately 55% of the portion of the lot will comprise front and rear yard setbacks. At the narrowest portion of the lot, 54% of the lot will comprise front and rear yard setbacks. So the ratio of the setbacks results in sound land use planning. Regarding the maximum improvement coverage, um, uh, the total impervious coverage will reduce from 44 to 40 40 percent and i believe we're largely consistent with your zone plan because uh, the 48 percent that's proposed for the improvement coverage is associated with that fire road i will note that um, in the m1b district where s storage facilities are permitted the maximum impervious coverage of 60 percent uh, is allowed 20 percent less than what's um, proposed here um, very quickly on the off-street parking, the applicant is really, these are really existing conditions that are, that are marginally, um, are, are really not being changed as part of this application dramatically, with the exception that the parking is being moved further from Route 22, further from Donahoe Road, and it's, it's less parking in total. In, in terms of, of how it's encroaching into the front and side yard setbacks, the, excuse me, the front uh, on Donahoe and also on Route 22, there, there, there are limited changes in, in the disturbance areas uh, there. And I'm, 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 I'm summarizing now. The loading in the front yard, the site has two front yards. Um, we thought Route 22 was the most appropriate frontage, and now it's angled and screened, so it would be furthest removed from residential. So we believe there was a better zoning alternative. Um, regarding the size of that facility, you heard testimony from the applicant that it was sized based on their needs. Allows for a big truck and a smaller truck. These are people in the self-storage facility business that understand what their needs are. So despite the variance relief, it meets the needs of the facilities. Regarding the three stories versus the two stories, the building is not taller than 35 feet 
as measured from ground to the roof, even that your height is an average calculation that's less than that. So it's not a substantial departure from your zone plan that allows up to 35 feet. For all these reasons, this application meets several purposes of the municipal land use law because the site is particularly well suited for the proposed use. It meets criteria A, it promotes the general welfare. Uh, it meets criteria C, it provides adequate light, air, and open space despite the dimensional uh, setback variances. And because of the need of this facility as testified, uh, it meets purpose G of the municipal land use law. Uh, the variances can be granted without a substantial detriment uh, to the public good in your zone plan. I testified that this is functionally a low traffic generator. We saw, we saw the architectural elevations that show the form of this project fits to the area. Uh, there's perimeter landscaping will remain and the applicant proposes to plant 38 deciduous trees 238 evergreen trees, 954 shrubs, 140 type of grasses, and 240 perennials and ground cover. So they're substantially adding to landscaping. Um, the, safe, the site will be safe and secure based on this is a user that operates multiple operations in less intense than office and medical uses. There will be no impacts to community facilities or schools, uh, no substantial negative lighting impacts, a low generator of noise, and the slopes while being uh, disturbed, um, those are from previous development. Um, the intent of the zone plan was created in 2004 when self-storage facilities were more industrial in character. Um, here, the building only has one small loading area facing Route 22, rather than numerous bay doors and the like. Uh, and this is an economic de development district with a master plan calls to focus commercial development. Uh, regarding the hillside development, you heard the testimony from the site engineer. Um, you know, the, the requirements are, are designed uh, to protect the health, safety, and welfare. Uh, they're also designed to, to maintain natural terrain, maintain ridge lines and skyline impacts. Those aren't being negatively impacted here on an already disturbed site. And to stop erosion, siltations, flooding, soil slippage, surface water runoff. And the engineer went through the seven points that it asked that your ordinance asked the planning board to evaluate when determining the appropriateness of, of building in steep slope areas and that the engineer testified that this application advances every one um, or meets every one of those requirements. Regarding the enhanced burden of proof, this is important, reconciling the emission of this use from the municipal master plan Self-storage facilities, I already partially mentioned this, are only permitted in the M1 manufacturing districts based on uh, a 2004 master plan recommendation. Um, and I, and I, I already testified to how these facilities have, have significantly involved, evolved over time where they're no longer industrial in character and now they can resemble other commercial land uses similar to offices that's proposed here. Um, um, I believe that there's accordingly, there's changed circumstances since that 2004 master plan uh, made the recommendation of only allowing it in the M1 district. There's also new demand and, and need in the community uh, for this facility today that, that's, that's needed for residents that, that, um, that has increased uh, over time. Um, and I kind of went really quick there in the end but um, um, from a planning perspective, this is uh, an application that an, uh, on paper, it feels um, that the variances and the extent of the variance relief is, is overly dramatic. But what you're really looking at is, is a use that fits well in this context, is largely benign, and is designed to be attractive. And it represents a, an ideal land use uh, between a, a commercial area and a residential district. Uh, I, I can't think of a better land use to put in this environment that's, that's passive that I would want to live next to, uh, knowing that a commercial land use is anticipated to go in an area than a self-storage facility. So that largely summarizes my testimony. All right, thank you. Board questions? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm hung up on the requirement that you show us that the proposed site is particularly well suited for the proposed use. Um, to me, that's a, 
it's a different way to say, how well does this fit? How well does this site accommodate this use? How well does this use fit this site? And I got issues with that when I take a look at a list of 12 variances, all of which that deal with setbacks are violated. You don't meet one setback, I don't think. Not one setback requirement. And if you take a look at two measures that, in my mind, scream over development, I'm talking about FAR and lot coverage. Your FAR, it's more than three times greater than what's allowed to square footage. Three, not 3%, not 13, but three times greater than what's allowed. Your lot coverage, more than 50% greater than what's allowed. To me, overuse, overdevelopment. You're screaming that at me. I, help me come to terms with that. Well, first, there's no area on this site that could be built without a variance because the, the shape of the property, um, your ordinance, you heard this from the site engineer, there's, there's no buildable area on this site per zone. Right? So that's effectively a taking of the property if, if you, if you um, didn't award any relief to an applicant. They can't do anything with the property. Um, floor area ratio, right, that, that's a measure of, of mass and intensity on a site, right? Um, you saw the architectural elevations that showed that the building, um, I, I felt, could be harmoniously integrated onto this, onto this property. It wasn't overly large. It's well lower in height than, than permitted by the zoning ordinance. It could have been taller. Um, in theory, these self-storage facilities could be, have greater volume in that manner. It's not like your, your office space. Um, and one of the key aspects here is, is that the site is so wide. It's 1,000 feet wide. So while the building is, is somewhat long, it's 300 feet, it still only represents a third of the property. So when you're driving by, still 66% of the property is going to feel without building because it's over 1,000 feet in width. Um, the design was, was intended to keep it lower because that was the existing height of the building in place today. And again, the FAR is calculating, it's adding and I don't wanna say artificially inflating, but it's, it's elevating the actual calculation based on slopes that are from already disturbed lands and from building area that's built into the grade, right? That's not changing the mass of the building and because it's a self-storage facility, I mean, part of the FAR is designed to um, regulate intensity, right? And these are passive facilities. So by there being more square footage, it's not making it in an overly intense facility. I mean, while this board doesn't eva evaluate factors for economic development, but we're meeting your impervious coverage requirement, and where, where these facilities are permitted in your M1B district at the 40%, you allow them to be at 60%. So arguably, there could be a facility with less square footage, more impervious coverage that you would have to uh, control, per se. Here, the applicant's reducing the stormwater on the site. It's making it better for the neighborhood. And it's, it's doing its best to architecturally, harmoniously integrate a building to appear like a permitted use in the zone, the office space. So if it looks and feels like an office and it's passive, I don't believe it's, I think it's, it works well here and it's, it's the best transitional land use that you can have from a commercial property to a, a residential zone. W would you want to live next to something that's more overly intense than a passive use like this? And the answer, I think, is no. Mr. Ricky, no, maybe you also excuse recognize. Excuse me, excuse me. What I'd like to live next to is a smaller version of what you're proposing. I mean, if you, were, if you were to come back with a smaller proposal, your setbacks would be improved, your FAR would be improved, your coverage would be improved. All of those things matter. And you could do a better job of meeting what the, what the land use ordinance requires. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Ricky, maybe you can also provide context as to the standard. <clears throat>
include nursing homes, continuing care retirement facilities, congregate care facilities, assisted living facilities, senior housing, not necessarily self-storage. Um, that's correct, yes. Um, on, that, on that question you have there to your, to your um, professional, what's the, what's the highest FAR um, in, in Bridgewater zoning currently? I did look at this in, in previously at one point. Just give me one moment. Mm -hmm. I think it's 0.35%, but I don't want to speak um, with, the, with a, an exception or two. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think it's probably around that or 0.4, and maybe the, the board attorneys can, if they have that information. But we're, if we're, we're saying 0.35 or 0.4, and as, in that as, general range, I agree. Okay, but we're, 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 we're talking about 0.9 here. So we're like double what any, you know, the highest allowed development is in Bridgewater. Uh, true, and, and, and I also suggested that um, when we, that's, that's also characterizing slopes on the property um, that have already been disturbed, and the number before that calculation was closer to, it was 0 0.693, and then um, about two thirds of the of the ground floor of the building are, are underground that aren't creating mass or for this use intensity, so they're not making the building appear larger. So I think um, the floor area ratio feels a lot smaller than that 0 0.905 because uh, if there wasn't that that slope calculation on already disturbed slopes, that calculation is the total square footage, right? divided by the lot area, because it's, it, the slope, my, my point is the slopes on the property don't change the mass of the building. Um, building into the grade doesn't change the mass of the building, and for this land use, it doesn't change the intensity of the building, because you're, for floor area ratio, you're, right, again, you're, you're regulating mass and you're regulating intensity. So I think the number's a lot closer realistically if you, can characterize those two functions than what's being presented at that 0 0.905 number. I think you, I think the previous gentleman testified 0 0.69 as that FAR without considering steep slopes, I believe. Uh, 0 0.693, and that, and that doesn't factor the the square footage of the of the the building that's underground because it's based on square footage. It's not based on square footage that's visible to the naked eye. Okay. And what zone would this facility be best suited in? Um, it's only permitted today in your M1B district. And what's the FAR for that district? Uh, I believe it's 0.35. 0.35, okay. Um, you know, All right, no further questions. Any other board members? Research that you did, the other permit, do you have any idea what the demand is for the other permitted uses in this zone? Are they mountain demands or do we have an idea of the building otherwise? Well, I suggested that there's a high amount of office vacancy in, in the county, the area, in the state overall. Besides the other right. permitted uses. Um, and then you're looking at assisted living type facilities. So, um, I mean, the applicant did reach out to the neighboring property. There, there was an interest there. Could it conceivably be, uh, was it fully evaluated whether another assisted living facility uh, could go there? Um, no, but that, that facility is going to, you know, require more parking and, and, and service needs in this facility. Um, but no, um, I don't have a conclusive answer whether another assisted living facility would, would move here. It's after 10 o'clock. We're going to wrap up. Um, Mr. Melnick, we'll see you on June 11th, it sounds like. All right, for members of the public, we're going to talk about re-noticing. So uh, for members of the public, this meeting will continue on June 11th at 7 p.m. in this room. There will be no further notices from the applicant, and we will continue 
with the cross-examination of Mr. Rickey. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so members of the public, this will be continued June 11th, 2024 at 7 p.m. Our next board meeting is April 23rd, 2024, 7 p.m. We have uh, a residential case that evening and we have a uh, application by 1200 Route 22. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? I move. All right, Mr. Widely, Mr. Gajewski. All right, thank you everyone, good night.